hate that it doesn't let you mute it now until it really? starts. It doesn't come up until it starts. That's convenient, huh? Right. And I'm like, I feel like we're live, but not here yet. There <laughs> we go. Okay, don't yell. And we're live. Welcome to From the Ground Up Podcast. Well, we didn't have to go NPR low level, but... NPR? In okay. PR. I just wanted to make sure. In PR. You Speaking of which, um, Reptile and Chill was on NPR, and... Speaking they, of which, can we talk about our own podcast first before well, we go to NPR? <laughs> you brought it up. No, I said NPR. Okay, I fucked up. Sorry, back it up. All right, PoorCityPython.com. Welcome we have to the Ground Up Podcast. Thank you guys for joining us today. So, <laughs> PoorCityPython.com, we do have some animals available as well as on Morph Market. And if you guys don't know, we do have a Patreon page. So, Patreon can give you rewards like you could see. Uh, I posted up my pairings before I posted up the video of the pairings that we did. I'm going to be posting up things like available animals before everyone else is going to be able to see them. Basically, I'm going to start putting out clutches just so some people can get first pick of that, you know, because there's always people who, well, there's already people on waiting lists, I guess. But I mean, other than that, that's another way to get in. Uh, Most of my, like the people who are first in the waiting list are typically like return customers who either have, you know, a baby from that clutch or something. So this gives you a good opportunity to see what's coming out first without having to spend the money and buy a baby first. You know, maybe this is your first season getting serious about corn snakes or something, or you just haven't bought from us. Then you have the opportunity to pick up something cool. As you mentioned in your little spiel, we have a new video out. So if you haven't checked out our video, if you're watching right now, you're already on YouTube. So hopefully you have seen our video. But if you're listening to Dude, if you're on the download and don't know that we stream live on YouTube, I just realized we never say live at 7 p.m. Eastern Uh typically on Mondays. I think we do. I don't know. (laughs) Whatever. But you messed me up. We have a new video that's talking about our breeding uh, plans this year. So go check it out and share it with your friends. Thank you um, to anyone who's already seen it, and sh- seen it and shared it. Seen it, shared seen it. it and shared it. Now you've seen some embarrassing moments in my life. From yeah, that video. pretty questionable uh, things happening, but that was fun to edit. It was fun to get back out there in YouTube land and do our thing. Other than that, NPR, uh, they had Reptile and Chill on. They were very braggadocious about the fact that they outdrank us. Okay, I was not trying to compete with them. I need to make that clear because that was talked about a lot on social media that, like, <laughs> oh, they drank us under the table. Number one, look at me and look at Phelps. There's no competition. Also, I wasn't trying. If we were trying to get wasted, we would have taken a whole bottle of shots, but I wasn't trying to yeah, do Yeah, plus that. we were taking shots. I mean, can we at least get a little bit credit that we were taking shots and they were During the podcast, and he was, oh, he was drinking cider. Let's take the oh, whole He was drinking man. cider. Ooh, that's rough. Okay, sorry. Our guest is probably like, <laughs> what are y'all going to stop talking and introduce me because this is the longest intro ever. Okay. Our guest today <laughs> is Tony Pantaleo. Tony is a falconer, and he basically... Um, I don't know. We're going to talk about it because I don't know. He likes birds. Well, no. He works in abatement and falconry. falconry. Of course. There you go. He did not just tell us those few things before the podcast. Both of which we don't know really what it is. So, Tony, welcome to the show. Give us just like a short uh, intro of basically what you do. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, So, I do, um, like you said, I do both abatement and falconry. Um, And the difference between those two is abatement is essentially um, pest control using raptors. Um, So my specialty is crows and corvids. Um, I also do pigeons. Um, But yeah, so we fly, I fly Harris Hawks uh, in urban areas. Like we get government contracts for the city and basically eliminate crow and pigeon pest issues. Um, And then I also do falconry, which is a hunting sport. So we'll take our hawks out and we hunt for wild game with our birds. Now, I know from like the small amount of research I've done, states typically, you know, you have some hoops to jump through as far as becoming a falconer. So how does one become one, basically? (laughs) 
Um, so yeah, it's it's very regulated. Um, so the main way you're going to start is you have to go and you call your local Department of Fish and Wildlife or DFG, whatever it is in your area, um, and you tell them you want to schedule a test to become a falconer. And the wait is usually at least a couple weeks to a month, um, but they'll schedule that. And then you study and you take the the test. And if you get an 80% or higher, um, you pass your exam. And then you go and you basically you have to so you have to acquire a sponsor, and you're an apprentice for two years. Um, and then you once you get your sponsor, you build your facilities, which is called a muse. Um, and usually muse are eight foot by eight foot minimum um, and usually most people will do 10 foot by 10 foot per bird uh, and then once you build that that you'll call a game warden and he'll come out and inspect your facilities um yeah like i said it's really regulated but damn so he'll people complain about <laughs> reptiles yeah right? that's what Dude, reptiles is nothing man <laughs> um, so uh so yeah they'll come out and inspect your facilities and then once you pass you're now um legally uh an apprentice for two years and so you can go with your sponsor and you can trap either a red-tailed hawk or a kestrel falcon. Um, and you'll fly, so you get your own bird as an apprentice. It's not like you're mucking out the stalls. Um, but you're, so you get this bird and they will walk you through the process of taking a wild bird from trap all the way through to training, flying free and hunting with this wild bird. That's wild. So uh, <laughs> how do you child, find- Your child, like you really go through so many things with it. How did yeah. you find a sponsor? Um, so the best way to find a sponsor is once you take your test and pass, they know you're pretty serious about this because um, this is a sport where there's a lot of tire kickers. So once you're serious, um, you reach out to like your local hawking club. Almost every state has one. And like I, I ended up going to a hawking meet, which is like, you know, everyone, all the bird nerds get together and they go hunting and fly their birds. And, uh, and I go, went there. I'm like, Hey, I, I'm basically a pre-apprentice, you know, I passed my test um, and I kind of networked a little bit and found someone who was willing to sponsor me. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of important to be select. It sounds dumb, but it's, it's not about like, I got to find the first person to sponsor me, but it's good to be selective because you're going to learn a lot from that person. Um, and so people who have a good sponsor really have a leg up. It's a real wealth of knowledge. Brian asked a good question in the chat. So are there different state and federal permits? I mean, do you need to appease to both? Yeah, so it used to be that there was kind of both, um, and now this, the the feds, because things, I, I don't know if they're getting backed up or what, but they've kind of deferred to the state. So now, like, for example, when you get your license, you submit everything to the state, you'll get a California, for me, California falconry license, um, and then when you trap your wild bird, like, whenever you trap or transfer or purchase a bird, you have to report it um, to your state now. So the only thing that's federally regulated is abatement. So, and then what do you have to do to get qualified to do that? Abatement. So I work as a subcontractor um, to get your abatement license. Like your like your own business. Um, I think it's like a, you have to be a, definitely a master falconer, which means you've been a falconer for seven plus years. Wow. Damn. Yeah, and um, I think it's ten for abatement, uh, and then you can get a federal permit. Because you know now you're using now you're using raptors, which are regulated um, for a for-profit business. And how did you, as far as when you get the sponsor and everything, when you get that first bird, are is it kept at the sponsor's place? No, so it's actually kept at your facilities. Okay. So they yeah, so like I said, sound, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's good for them to work, you know, hands-on with you, and you kind of have to listen to what they say. But yeah, it's your own bird. You trap it like. You can go hunt with it if you have available time. You don't have to wait for them. Okay, so you can kind of start yeah. before you're technically. Yeah, you like so once you're an apprentice, that's it's your bird, you know. Um, and if like that that sponsor doesn't fall through, falls through, you can always find a, another sponsor. You have like a set period. So, pardon my use of the word like enclosure or cage, but <laughs> what is the, <laughs> the typical build for this? <laughs> thing that you put this bird in. Yeah, that's the that's the like I said, the falconry jargon. You know, it's got its own language. Is is a muse, M E W S. Um, and so it 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 kind of varies depending on where you're at. What was that? I was trying to no, I was spelling it out in my head and like 
And that, that is not what I thought it was. Because that's not how I thought you were going to spell it. And then I had to, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yes. Um, so, yeah, it's called a Muse. And it kind of varies depending on where you're at. Like, if you live somewhere like Michigan um, or Wisconsin where it's really snowy, you're going to want, like, a fully enclosed, essentially, generally it's a, it's a building built out of, like, plywood or a shed um, with vertical bars um, for windows. And then um, people like to have what's called a double door system. That Kind of like at a zoo in an aviary, you know? You you walk into an antechamber and you close the door and then you open another one just in case um, they escape. But like in California, um, I, because it gets pretty warm where we're at, I like to do, it's like half enclosed and half like wire. Sorry, he's getting a little fussy. Um, half, half enclosed and half wire um, so that... Uh, so that he can go in and out, weather right. himself, you know. And I guess we should talk about now the trapping process. Is there, first of all, is there anyone out there like breeding these animals? Is that even a I thought? Think. Yeah. 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 So, you know, 40, 50 years ago, every bird was wild caught. But now we have pretty strong um, captive bred programs. And these are not for profit businesses just because the, the costs associated with breeding falcons is astronomical. So it's usually just people who love these animals. Um, love these animals and they sorry. <laughs> I'll put them away if he keeps it up. Um, but they uh, they just love these animals and they're doing it to further further, you know, the species and the availability in captivity. So So you gotta have a bank to breed falcons. Yeah so most fal sometimes but most people are just kind of breaking even and they do it because they love it, you know. So Falcon. why is it so much more difficult to breed uh, breed hawks and stuff in captivity? It's not necessarily difficult. It's just a lot of costs associated with it, you know. Um, people are getting really good at it. Um, they're doing, like, hybridized falcons now um, to mm -hmm. create the ultimate bird, you know, they want to fly. Um, and it's all, you know, artificial insemination for the most part. So it's, it's not oh, challenging. So they're not... <laughs> I like <laughs> it's not like snakes, you know. <laughs> For people in the download, Melissa just made a weird hand gesture. Where they did. I don't even know how to explain it. But... Yeah, so, it's, what I... it's nothing I recognize, oh. though. <laughs> I mean, like, wait. So if you know, how do you artificially inseminate them first? So generally, a vet does it. Okay, so, so yeah, you'll have you'll have a vet. So they have this is kind of weird, and you I don't know everything about this, but so a lot of people that have imprint birds, there's something called like it's like a falcon sex hat. So I don't know if this is PG or not, but they wear this you special know, hat. Not a PG. I keep forgetting this is not a PG podcast. Yeah, it be thirteen and over, maybe Thanks, mom. All right, All right cool. <laughs> so yeah, they wear this special hat, right? And for the male falcon, and the male falcon will mount this hat, and they will collect the semen samples on the hat. No fucking way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe the falcon sex hats. Definitely. I don't know all the answers about it, because, you know, people usually want to know more, but. <laughs> well. <laughs> Why can't you just let them do it? So, if you're making hybrids, sometimes they can, but it's, uh, and again, it's, it, Bird imprinting is really complicated. That's only usually for imprints. Um, so imprints basically recognize whatever they're imprinted on, which in this case is a human, as what they are. So they think they are the same as us. So if they see another falcon, they don't generally recognize it to be something that they can breed with. Um, and so they have to collect, especially if they're making hybrids. So it's a totally different species. So they collect the semen and do the AI that way. So you're telling me this this animal up to the left of you thinks it's a human right now no so this this well, isn't he is the same as him yeah no so this isn't an imprint yeah so there's different different ways you can do it um there's it's kind of complicated but generally the most common are like parent reared um or imprints or, or passage which means a wild bird that you've trapped um so this is it's, this is raised by its parents for the first like 16 weeks of its life so it knows it's a bird, um, and then it's then it's removed from the chamber when it's fully feathered, and we'll start the training process that way. Are there advantages to either, the you know, the different ways? The yeah. Yeah, there are definitely advantages to both. Um, so hawks, like, so red tails and Harris hawks, which is, this is a Harris hawk, 
Um, are generally you can't fly imprints. They're they kind of tend to be a little bit neurotic, um, and so you can only do parent reared um, or passage, which means a wild trap. Um, and then, uh, but falcons, yeah, there's advantages to both, um, both imprints versus versus parent reared birds. And is that like that's beneficial as far as for your need as far as hunting or say abatement? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So it kind of comes down to your need, um, whether the bird's going to be used for abatement or for um, falconry and what you're going to hunt, how you want the bird to fly, you know. So like it's when these birds, we generally we use GPS or telemetry when we fly them um, just to keep track of them so we don't lose them. But falcons, so the way you hunt with a falcon is you basically generally send it up to what's called a, like a pitch and it'll spiral up high in the air, you know, 500 to 1,000 feet. Um, and then you, your goal is basically they're the hunter and you're kind of the bird dog. But so you come in and you scare up game for it, whether that's ducks or pheasants. Um, and then you'll see this falcon just take this pitch and dive down. It stoops down um, and it will take the birds out of the air. And so sometimes that can turn into kind of a long, long chase. So it's nice to have the telemetry and the radio. Um, but imprints tend to be a little bit um, harder to lose. So that's definitely a big plus for them. Yeah, because I have heard that you can basically go out and fly your bird. It doesn't and come it never back. Comes back. Yeah, it happens seldom, you know, with, with the advances in technology. Like at this point, when I'm flying my birds, especially for abatement in an urban area, I pull out my phone and I get an exact coordinate where the bird is. So, so what kind of device is being used as far as, I know it's GPS, but like how is it attached to the bird? So there's a couple ways. Um, the, the biggest brand is, is called Marshall, and it's, it's like a receiver with a long antenna. And so the three common ways to attach it is called a leg mount, where you attach it to the leg, a backpack, which is like a, like a Teflon backpack that the bird wears, and you clip it between its wings. And the third one is a tail mount. So I run a backpack on all my birds just because it's out of the way for them. Right. And that doesn't, yeah, so that's out of the way, so it doesn't affect them in any way as far as flying and doing their thing? No, it, it doesn't seem to hinder them whatsoever as long as you have a good fit. And now, how do you go about trapping a wild bird? Um, trapping, I mean, I don't know. I probably won't get into too, too much specific detail um, just because it's regulated, but so, so there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Generally, it involves a net or um, there's something called, if someone's serious and, you know, they want to go through all the regs and stuff, there's something called a ball shot tree, which is a mouthful. But it's um, basically you build your trap and you go, you'll go along, say you're trapping red tails, it's your first bird. You'll kind of drive along um, and you'll gen generally see like a power pole where they're perched on top of, which is pretty common. Um, and you may come by and you'll set the trap on the road and you'll keep driving a couple hundred yards um, and you'll turn around and usually with binoculars you'll watch um, and hope the bird comes down and um, they're all humane traps you know either net them or, or snare their toe and then you can uh, you once the bird's trapped you'll make in um, you'll cast it which means you usually put it like some sort of film or like a towel or or something around them uh, you'll put a hood on them to calm them down. And then generally what I like to do is I put my gear on right there in the field, the anklets and the jesses well, and the leashes. Yeah, and then you keep them kind of with the hood on, relax till you get home. Um, and I'll tether them on a perch with the hood on and put them in a really like low light room so they stay calm. And then um, you remove the hood and you can start the, it's called manning, which basically is like a taming process. So is there like a quarantining procedure with ones that come out of the wild yeah definitely so you can do i like I mean, there's a million different ways and you know with falconry if you ask someone a question nine out of ten you know everyone has a different answer what's right um animal people are very opinionated but my personal way to do it is um i use a, like a frontline spray and i'll treat for external parasites um or or a powder but i prefer the spray uh and treat for external parasites and then um, you can give them different different medicines to treat for internal things. Um, you know, it just depends on the bird and the area you're at. But I generally try to give them just a general 
general medical regimen, and I keep them away from any any captive birds I already have for sure. How long are you keeping them separate for? I mean, it's kind of subject. It's kind of you know up to you. I generally will try to keep them. If it's a, a wild bird, I'm only keeping for a year. I generally try to keep them away permanently, and I, oh. I have. But you know, after like probably six to nine weeks, you could put them within you know close vicinity to each other. Not really a rule of thumb. Gotcha. So you kind of hinted at it, but you basically let your bird go after a year, or how does that work? Yeah, so it's kind of up to you. Um, people will t think you know it's kind of cruel to take a wild bird, but we the way we do it um, to try to contribute to conservation because falconers, you know, if we can agree on one thing, it's conservation. And so what we will try to do is we take, like I said, it's called a passage bird. And what that means is it's less than a year old and their mortality rate is like over 70%. It's really high. And so we're trapping a bird that more than likely <laughs> is probably going to die anyways. <laughs> I know it's a terrible noise. That's your no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more time, bud, and then you're going to go away. Uh, no, but you no, no, I'm away. <laughs> It strained your ears too. Um, so you trap this bird and the likelihood is this bird was going to die anyways. And you'll help it survive a winter. You'll help it become a more effective hunter. Um, and then once it molts and reaches its adult plumage, um, we will re -re Some people keep it for two or three years and they'll, it's called intermewing. You keep it in your muse over the molt and, and fly it again the second or third year. I've never done it. I generally will let my bird go at the end of the year and, and retrap. And... I mean, they basically just go back to being wild animals or yeah. are they always wild animals or they're never accustomed to humans? Yeah. So the, the dichotomy of like a wild bird is like, it knows how to hunt flawlessly and all you're doing is teaching it to allow you to be part of that process and to rely on you as a teammate, you know? And so they've, they've survived without you and, and they go pretty back pretty well to surviving without you again. Um, we do something called hacking, which means we'll set them out with food. Um, for the first few days, and then once they stop taking the food, we know that they're hunting on their own. Um, you know, given suitable habitat, we'll just kind of let them go from there. And they won't like come back and be like, "Hello, old friend," and <laughs> land on your head. <laughs> Pretty much, no. You know, within a few days, they decided that it's just they're on their own. Yeah, like fuck this guy, burn that bridge. Let's never see this. <laughs> That's kind of how it is, and you're like, well, you you just like totally have uh, what is that Stockholm syndrome, where you think like they're attached to you, so you're like, oh, he's definitely gonna come back, and then they don't. You're like, oh, I'm broken hearted, but he doesn't care. He never did. <laughs> you were just a tool. Do you get attached? Is it hard not to get attached? Um, you get you get attached in. It, it, to a degree, but it's good not to over like anthropomorphize your your birds, you know, because like they have a very reptilian brain, a lot like you know, a lot like reptiles you work with. Which is funny because a lot of people do that with their snakes. I feel like yeah. too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you don't want to boop a snoot in my. <laughs> that is exactly where my brain was going. <laughs> so do you? I mean, are there birds that just end up doing better, doing worse, or is it all dependent on you or is there personalities involved? Def yeah, there's it's both, um, but there's absolutely individual personalities um, that dictate, you know, how effective a bird may or may not be. Um, yeah, it's just like training a dog or anything else, you know, different animals are just more effective. Yeah, now people in the chat are kind of asking, like, if you have a young trained bird I mean, would you sell that? Is there anyone who will basically start the process for you or you have to do the nuts to bolts? I mean, that's, is that kind of the point? Like when you're starting off as an apprentice, can you buy a bird? Is that the question? Yeah, or like anyone, can you just buy a bird that someone trapped and did all the deworming and everything like that and all the hard no. stuff for you? Yeah, so no, you don't, you can never sell or- <laughs> Well, I mean, you're licensed, of course, but- <laughs> Yeah, no, even if you're licensed, you can never sell or buy a wild animal like so it would only be captive bred birds you know so if i guess technically if you're an apprentice and someone had a wild trap bird they could transfer it to you for free um but generally your sponsor doesn't like you to do that they're going to want you to go through the whole process start to finish and so um so yeah you can do it but there's no money ever changing hands when it's a wild bird 
I guess now that we're on the the um, money as far as <laughs> goes, like the backpack, the GPS and stuff, like how much does it cost even for like the simple stuff if someone was looking to get started? So basically it, the most expensive part of the process when you're getting started is building your facilities. Um, so that can go anywhere from, I think probably the cheapest you could build the facilities and do it right would be about 500, four to 500 bucks. Um, but you could spend, you know, up to five grand doing it. Um, so that's going to be, I would say to get started, you're going to need probably a minimum of a thousand dollars. So say it's 500 bucks for your facilities. Um, it's going to be about 300 to 350 for your licensing and your inspection alone. And then you're going to need probably the equipment, excluding telemetry, which it, or the GPS is going to be about another 300 bucks. You know, two to 300 bucks. There's about a thousand dollars right there. Um, and then you can probably the cheapest you can find to use telemetry would be, and a receiver would be about three to 500 bucks. So yeah, it's going to cost you. It's <laughs> <very dangerous. laughs> there are so many ways that you're weeding out people who are not interested. Like, not interested. <laughs> really like I feel like in order just to get everything straightened out, you need to be so serious about it, which is yeah. awesome. So yeah, I decided right. when I was like 14, I was like, I'm going to, maybe like 13, 14, I'm going to be a falconer. Like that is what I'm going to do. And I didn't get my license until I was like 25. Yeah, 24. You know, just because I was like, I didn't get all those things. <laughs> you what? Because you got to have the money. Yep, you know, the money and my own house and my facilities. and. So is it cheaper? You said you do half wire because you're in California. Is it cheaper mm -hmm. to do that way? Yeah, it, it is. Okay. Um, a lot of money. Yeah, it, it would be cheaper, but I built instead of building like half and half, like five foot by five foot and five foot by five foot, I built two ten foot by ten foot enclosures, you know, and so you can do it's a little bit bigger. Um so but it is cheaper to do the wire portion for sure. Benefits of living in a warmer climate. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. Now, feeding. Obviously, you use these birds for hunting. So mm -hmm. when you do hunt, is the food for them or is it for you or is it for both of you? So it's kind of it just depends on the individual. For me, 95% of the time what they catch is for them. But I don't feed them in the field, if that makes sense. So what I do is you train your birds to do something called trading off. And so when they catch game, you go out there and you have what's called a lure and a lure could be anything, but it's an item they see on a rope that they know is like, Oh, that is food. And so when you, when you, when you move into them where they've caught their food, um, you generally will offer them the lure and they will have <laughs> happily. <laughs> I'll put it. You guys want me to put them away? No, no, no. no, no. Getting so, better. Okay. My, my reactions okay. are getting soft. <laughs> um, okay, so, it's not, it's not doing anything else. Right, yeah, <laughs> He's just, he's snacking down here. Um, and so. Is he on your arm right now? Yeah, he's on my hand, on my glove. <laughs> 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 he's up for <laughs> Well, they do have hollow bones, right? <laughs> they kind of like. Yeah. How much so he's, he's, yeah. he's like, um, his flying weight is 700 grams, basically, 715. Wait, what is the weight? Wait, what is the so yeah, I figured we, I figured we broke that. It's a, so when you fly these really birds, threw you off subject, you were no, definitely okay. talking about something else. Back to the hunting really quick. What you do is you basically trade them off and you take the game. Um, and that does two things. You can keep hunting because they're not full. And then it allows me to freeze it, check it for internal parasites, make sure it's safe for them to feed. And then I'll allow them, I'll use that to feed them for, you know, a week or two at a time. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so can you, can you start on like regular feeder rodents that you would have for your snakes? Yeah, so f until they're catching game, I, I breed rats for my snakes. And so they, these guys, the hawks, can live perfectly off of rodents. You know, it's like the perfect diet for them. So um, I do treat it periodically with something called Vita Hawk, but with rats, it's not really essential. It's kind of just a boost in nutri nutrition. Vita Hawk, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you guys have a lot of cool, like, leather goods and stuff to buy like the gloves and, uh, and, the, and the hoods and, uh, 
<laughs> it's definitely a money pit and it takes over your life a little bit, but that's, you know, it's worth it. Okay. Um, flying weight. Okay, that? flying weight. So basically what we do is um, we do what's called weight management with raptors that we're flying. And so it's kind of like an athlete. You always want to keep them at their peak condition. If they're too fat, they're not going to want to fly and hunt and come back to you because they have no incentive. And then if they're too skinny, you know, you never want them to be weak or hungry um, or underfed because we want to be humane and we, we love these birds. Um, and so you find what's an optimal weight for them to chase game and be strong and effective, you know, but, but not too fat where they don't really want to kind of, you'll, you can tell if they're fat, they're going to fly kind of half heartedly. Um, and so you find that optimal weight and it can kind of move a little bit actually over time. It tends to go up and increase and, uh, but you keep them at that weight. So, so the way you do weight management is once you find that weight, um, we'll weigh them in the morning. And then generally in the after, in the evening, and we'll calculate how many grams per hour they're burning. And then we'll, yeah, exactly. And you'll be like, okay, <laughs> it's super, it's not always expensive, it's time consuming. <laughs> and statistics and stuff. <laughs> and so once you figure out how many grams per hour they're burning, which also changes given the temperature, um, you... <laughs> You'll feed them like the exact amount that they will need so they'll be at the optimal weight the next day when you anticipate you'll fly. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, are you constantly weighing this bird throughout its lifetime? Yeah. Yeah. Every, I weigh both my birds at least once a day. Yeah, generally. And twice a day. What kind of scale are we using here? <laughs> so I use literally the exact same question. <laughs> no, no, no. So I mean, how do you weigh a hawk, right? Um, so we use I have the exact same scale that I use for my snakes, but I epoxy a, like a perch onto it, like a tea perch with some astroturf, um, and then you just zero it with the perch on there, and you teach them to step up onto that, and you weigh them like that. Simple. Simple. <laughs> and with different. I mean, this also might be a dumb question. With different species, are you expecting different weights? Absolutely, yeah, for sure. So, like, if you start with a red tail, you're going to have uh, – and which is generally what people start is with. Is that a general red starter? Red yeah. So, you, like I said, I mentioned that you can start with the red tail or the kestrel. But so generally it's better to start with a red tail because a, a red tail, like a male will weigh, you know, 700 to 900-ish grams, and then a female will weigh – a thousand to thirteen hundred ish grams at least in, in our area our locales um and so they're burning and when it's cool colder they're burning like 50 to 80 grams a day and a kestrel only weighs a male kestrel only weighs like 80 to 100 grams and so the weight management is so precise on that bird that it, that's that's generally the reason it's better to start with a red tail they're more forgiving as far as learning weight management and so after you get your red tail, I mean, what are kind of the steps as far as your progress goes from what animals so you can not, work with and how do you higher. get qualified to do? Each yeah. One? Okay. So, so when, like I said, when you're the apprentice, you can have the two. And then after your two years, um, if everything goes according to plan, you've had a bird for at least four months out of each hunting season. Um, your sponsor will generally advance you to become what's called a general falconer. And as a general falconer, you can have, Kind of the world opens up there to a slew of birds. Um, you can have peregrine falcons, juror falcons, um, Harris hawks, goss hawks. The majority of birds that you can fly as a falconer are now available to you. Um, pretty much off the top of my head, the only thing I can think of really that master falconers can fly that the rest of us can't um, are golden eagles. Um, but they're they're so regulated anyways, at least in California that. Generally, you have to go through Department of Fish and Wildlife to even get them. Mm. You can't trap an eagle ever. And now someone asked earlier, owls. Are <laughs> owls a thing? Uh, I, I, I definitely think it, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people want, including myself, are so interested in working with owls when they get into this. Um, and you can do it, but they're not great falconry birds for two reasons. Um, 
So generally what people fly for falconry are Eurasian eagle owls or great horned owls, which being the most common. Um, so two reasons that I don't recommend them is one, owls hunt at night. In most states, it's not legal to hunt at night. Um, and two, owls don't have what's called a crop, which is for non-bird people, it's like a storage system in their throat where they store their meals and slowly burn it over time. And so owls, because they don't have a crop, their training process is only limited to what they would eat in one sitting. Right then. Uh -huh. Exactly. But they'll metabolize that sometimes two or three times a day. So it's like your training process is drug out, you know, for the fit, maybe you say, this is just an arbitrary number, but they can only have 15 to 20 grams at a time instead of the 80 that your red tail is eating. So yeah, it makes training a lot longer. Um, and then you're hunting at dusk for like 30 minute windows. Why is it at night? <laughs> Not, not, yeah, not all states, but most states it's illegal to hunt at night. And so the people that do hunt at night, like in UK, they'll 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 hunt at night with um it's called lamping or like lamp lighting, but I think it's lamping, but they'll go out at night and they'll hit game with a spotlight. And so then the owl will see it, they'll illuminate it for the owl and then they'll chase them that way. Oh, Which that's, that's kind of like like spotlighting deer is like a big no no. Yeah. It's very not exactly. uh, it's not really fair game. Wait, so why? Well, because the deer, when you they're blinded, put, they're blinded <laughs> so they're just standing there. So of course anyone can shoot them at that point. But that's illegal. So I guess that I'm sure that ties in more so than they just say all hunting's illegal at night because like yeah. yeah, people are doing shady stuff, I suppose. <laughs> or I mean, plus it's just like. I'm sure it's just more dangerous in general at night. For who? Yeah. <laughs> For the human that's going out there at night? If you want to go out there and give yourself right at night, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's all regional um, depending on where you're at. But people do – I would say, like, it's a very, very small percentage of people who fly owls. Um, and those people who fly owls, if they catch any game at all in the, during the season, it's, like, a great season for them, whereas, like – with a good pair of Harris Hawks, you would hope to catch, you know, 100 to 200 head a game in a season. Yeah, so is there, like, a more productive bird? Like, what would be the most productive bird? And is there a ratio between, like, easy to train, most productive, <laughs> or, like, a sweet spot? The ball python of the, of the falconry world would be this guy right here. It's called a Harris Hawk. Um, they're a very easy to train. So, so it, it's kind of – more dependent on the falconer, essentially, to answer your question before I go off on a tangent. Um, but, you know, some birds are more effective than others, um, and some birds are more effective at hunting what specific kind of game you want. So, like, if I wanted to hunt quail, um, I would probably take, um, like, a cooper's hawk would be the most effective for that. Ducks would be, ducks in a big pond would be a falcon. Or if I wanted to hunt ducks out of a ditch, it would be a goshawk. So you kind of cater what you want to catch and how you want to catch it to the bird. Wait, they take down ducks? Oh, definitely, yeah. So one of the most common things that you hunt with a falcon would be... I do think ducks were the exception. <laughs> I thought you were just getting rabbits. <laughs> in, in your defense, like 80% of... Like, I don't know if it's a hard... It's not a hard number, but like 80% of falconers are hunting rabbits. So, But then the hardcore falcon dudes are hunting ducks. I thought ducks were scared. <laughs> like, no, I don't know. It's just... I didn't know that hawks <laughs> eat ducks in general. I mean, obviously they must eat ducks in the wild. Yeah. So for with falcons, obviously again not the hard, hard and fast rule, but generally you're hunting birds with falcons. So that's what they're taking that tall pitch, and they're you scare the birds up, and they're stooping mm -hmm. down. And like I told you, um, so ducks are the most common. Sometimes quail. Um, the really hardcore guys are hunting sage grouse. So yeah, you can you can definitely hunt birds. And is this just on public land, just like you would regular hunting, or you know, does, do the same rules apply in a sense? Kind of. So you all the same rules apply, except for the rules about where you can shoot. So it's a little bit easier to hunt in an urban area with a hawk, like a semi-urban area, you know, fields and in neighborhoods and stuff where there's game availability. Um, but you know, it's it's generally it's public land. It's a little bit easier to get private land permission with as far as falconry goes because you know people just don't like you shooting on their land so i found it easier to get get public access 
or private access with my with my birds and my guns. And I would I would think that it would be more benefit to say a farmer for you to take down, you know, rodents. I mean, is yeah. there are are people looking for people like you for that particular yeah, reason I was on their land? Yeah, that for abatement. Like, are people calling you up, or like, how's that? For rodents? Yeah, I mean, particularly like for if you want to hunt rodents on farmland, or like, what? Obviously, a farmer. A lot of people when they hunt, you know, even deer. People who I know, uh, farmers who had corn, like someone would ask, "Hey, can I?" hunt deer there because obviously the deer eat, eat, the, eat corn, the corn and, and the hunter would be like yeah man you can come over or they're like no yeah. i hunt this but i feel like someone's like if you're just like yeah i want to pluck rodents off your farm i feel like people would be much more likely to do that yeah definitely so um rodents i mean so rodents they're usually pretty cool about letting you and I, i'm a farmer too so i kind of know a lot of um other farmers but they're pretty cool about letting you do rodents but it's not i mean it's so hard to do enough damage with a hawk on rodents to make a difference but what they really love is is we have European starlings here, um, and they're an invasive species, and they're really like they damage crops, especially grapes, um, wine grapes where we're at, and blueberries. And so if you come out there and say, hey, I want to fly my falcon on your starling murmurations, generally they are just thrilled to have you out there. Because, you know, that's the bulk of abatement actually is flying agricultural areas for starlings and, and pest birds. So what would be like a good yield as far as starlings would go? In a day, just oh. can, can you hear, hear us? us? Uh oh, did your AirPods die? If they did, it's not a big deal. One sec, I'm not hearing you guys. Mm -hmm. Well, we can talk about this. Is crazy, otherwise. <laughs> and I wonder. I want to ask him. Do people like pay him to come out there to like clear the rodents up? Their land. I wonder if that's. Okay. I would assume it's situational. And we'll ask. anyone who's listening, Carly has a good question in the chat. There's some weird noises coming from. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. I'm assuming he's still trying to work that. But Carly asks in the question or in the chat, do you ever hunt with two birds at once or strictly just one? And Jose, who seems like now we're thinking about birds too, um, said that um, <clears throat> Harris hawks can hunt with other Harris hawks but most are solitary hunters. And I thought that was an interesting thing. Like you have 10, like, do you have to just like do <laughs> one at a time? Like that seems sucky. Like I would want to go release all 10. I would just, just open up and just let 10 just birds let go. Out. I don't know. I don't know. It seems like, seems like, I don't know how to know how that works. You have the GPS or whatever. Oh, we can hear ourselves and we can hear you. Yeah. yeah I don't know what happened. That's weird. I don't know. AirPods, maybe. Yeah, maybe that was not a solid choice. <laughs> I don't know how those work. I don't but, know how those work either. Um, a, a yield as far as starlings go, I mean, what would be a good day out with one hawk? So, I mean, with starlings, um, you're pretty much exclusively using falcons um, because they're, they take that acrobatic flying style where they pitch up. But even if you catch no starlings for a – like. Even if you catch no starlings, um, it's effective as far as abatement goes. And so we're not, when you go out for, I'll kind of break it up. When you go out for abatement, you're not even trying to catch starlings. Um, you're just putting your falcon in the air um, and you're swinging your lure and he's stooping down and doing these accurate, like this aerial displays so that the starlings see, hey, there's a falcon in here. A scatter. Exactly. They say, here's a predator here. We better get out of here. Um, and the goal, you know, is to get rid of them. But if you're out there hunting starlings, if you get one, it's a good day. You know, if you get your bird back, Falconer say if you get your bird back, it's a good day. Um, but, <laughs> but people, it's not uncommon to go out and like triple, double, triple, um, even get four in a day with a really good falcon. So what um, what different birds do you have? So right now I only have two Harris hawks, and um, they generally one is for abatement and one is for hunting. Um, my bird absolutely loves feral pigeons but that's not a whole lot of fun to hunt so i try to take him out um and do uh like he hunts rabbits a little bit he hunts quail which is my preferred thing to hunt but he's just not super effective at it um because he's really not the best suited bird for it but so i keep my two hair socks and then i'm gonna take a wild cooper sock next year um, and just focus on hunting quail with that so is there there's an advantage to saying having one for abatement and one for hunting. 
keeping that separate? Yeah, so actually you're not supposed to hunt. You're not supposed to use the same bird as a subcontractor to do both. Why not? Um, you know, I don't really... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it seems in my head, it seems like it'd be confusing for the bird of like when they're supposed to go get. Plus, it, it sounds like it's just the rules. So. I don't know, but there's a reason behind every rule, isn't there? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bad question. <laughs> it's, it's the rule, I guess. <laughs> it's the rule. Okay. Cool. Got it. <laughs> So you gotta have the money for two guys if you yeah. want to do this. <laughs> Which means, <laughs> so does that mean that you need two ten by ten enclosures, or can you house them together? So when they're at their weight, we generally keep them. Um, not everyone, but we generally keep them tethered, and so you can keep them in a ten by ten together. But during the off season, you're gonna need you're gonna need another ten by ten to free loft them or keep them free anyways, or them while they're molting and the rest of the year. And so I, you know, I have two ten by tens. So what is off season? So there's falconers have their own hunting seasons um, for different game, but generally we can start hunting in the middle of August, and we end March seventh. Again, region specific, but we end March seventeenth because that's the last day of cottontail season, um, and that's kind of the last season except for jackrabbits are year round. So generally, most people are done by end of February, early March. And they'll put their birds, fatten them up to molt. So if like March eighteenth, you're out there, and yeah. like you can get in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. It's poaching, just like um, it would be to hunt with a gun out of season. Interesting. And I mean, that's a really long season, though. So I feel like that's. <laughs> but then yeah. it's like I'd be bored the rest of the time. But I mean, usually hunting seasons are like a couple months at a time. But I guess obviously with the type of things that you're hunting. It's a different story. Um, do you do a lot more abatement in the off season of hunting? What's that? Do you do a lot more abatement in the off season of hunting? I wish. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> I, unfortunately, the seasons are kind of synonymous. I do abatement from October to April. Okay, so it's similar ish. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So then just April to August, you're just hanging out. Exactly. Yeah, we'll put them up for molt, and then it's kind of nice. Kind of works out is, so my, I harvest grapes from August to October, and then I start abatement from October until you know um, April while I'm hunting that whole time, and then I stop, and that's kind of when my my snakes are all laying their eggs, and and I'm you know hatching babies. I'm gonna have that downtime to to focus on that. So it kind of all works out. Yeah. Now, do you have like control over? I mean, what they take? Because I mean, obviously there's hunting seasons, but what if they take the wrong prey? Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, you're kind of trying to put them in positions where you're not going to, but it, it can happen. And I think I'm, I may be wrong here, but I think it's an unofficial rule. Is like called the let it lie rule. It may be an official rule, but you basically, if they take game that's out of season or not, they're not supposed to take. You're supposed to let it lie in the field. You're not supposed to touch it. You're supposed to trade them off um, and just leave it there, essentially. That seems – it's weird because, like, obviously you need people not to bring them back because it's easy to get away with hunting them out of season. But also letting it lie is also bullshit because, like, you want it to go to use. It's wasteful, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's weird. That's a weird rule. But uh... <laughs> At the same time, you know – Someone who doesn't really care about the rules uh, may take that, you know, oops, sorry, it was an accident. It was an accident. Right, they and just keep taking advantage of it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, can I, can mine is off topic because yours on topic. <laughs> no. <laughs> Ooh, I wonder whose is more off topic. Go. Okay, mine is from like half an hour ago. Hmm. But <laughs> don't <laughs> at just me. <laughs> uh, is there a stigma to hybridization like there is in snakes no it's kind of i mean it's kind of like the accepted norm now um and it's kind of actually has been from the like almost the beginning um so some people don't their preference is to not have hybrids like i'm not a huge fan of hybrids uh, but it's not like snakes where people are like adamantly opposed to
to them. It's not an area of contention, you know. It's like it it exists, and if you don't like it, you don't have to fly it. But no one's upset about it. Is there ever an issue of people not accurately representing their bird as a hybrid? Or you feel like that's not really a problem. No, yeah, our community is so small that it's like uh, everything's really traceable, you know, and so it's everything's pretty much if they were to lie, which I don't, I've never heard of, um, it would be pretty easily, you know, discovered. So but and they, I, they, so they they want to be honest and upfront about it. I didn't. I should have asked this earlier when it when you brought it up, but <laughs> the captive. I guess I don't know if you'd call them captive born and bred. That's like we would. Words, but, okay. uh, <laughs> but would you keep those for their whole lifetime? Yeah, yeah. generally you're keeping them for their whole lifetime. Yeah, you can transfer them later, um, just like you could sell a snake, you know, down the road. Um, but most people, you get attached, and once they're effective, you'll end up keeping it for its full lifetime. And why do you choose to keep on? basically like retraining a bird every year instead of just like getting a, <laughs> one of those. Um, so I keep my captive birds, which I, you know, I'll, I'll keep them probably forever um, for the remainder of their life. But then there's something about the process of getting a new bird. Tra I mean, trapping's fun and training a new bird's fun. And so, and then seeing them develop from trap to being effective hunter in tandem with you is really, to me, one of the most rewarding parts. So I don't travel bird every year, but you know, I like to. And is there, is there a bird, and I'm sure there is, because everyone has it, is there birds that you want to work with, but you haven't yet? Definitely, yeah. So my, um, my next bird will probably be what's called an Oplomato falcon. And so those live kind of like in like Central through Southern America, like the most common place you find them is Peru. Um, and those are just really fun, kind of like micro falcons, and they hunt from your fist mainly, um, and so you get to see the, the flights close up. And then my ultimate goal, um, which is kind of like expert level, would be to fly a goshawk. Say that type of falcon again. <laughs> Aplomato. She's, she's trying to spell it to Google it. And it's like real sad that I got zero results. So I really it messed up. With no suggestions. I really messed up the spelling. If I can't get it. E-L-O-M-A-D-O. Uh, there oh, we go. <laughs> oh, they look tiny. It looks like a little mini peregrine falcon and that's which is probably nothing close to what an actual person who knows anything about birds yeah, would say so that's somewhere. probably embarrassing but you know whatever that's what it looks like to me you know they, yeah they're i mean they, they're the same color scheme same body structure and everything they're just really small what's their uh, max weight ideal max weight. females probably hunt like around 400 grams i'd say oh yeah that's tiny yeah now you're all into bird weights, apparently. Like, you know it's tiny. <laughs> oh, he told the 1300 before, so that's half of what he said earlier. Is it, I mean, obviously this is a not a native bird. So is there kind of the same thing to where, like, exotics are cool? Say, in snakes, you know, the exotic pets are kind of the more sought after in, in a sense. Same as humans. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> Um, kind of. It just depends um, on what you want. A lot of people still love to fly native birds. Um, there's something to be said. People like being able to fly passage trapped birds. Um, but then exotic birds Exotic birds are kind of a new earth thing, you know, in the last, like, uh, I don't know. I think like, guys like uh, Steve Shingren and a lot of these guys started bringing birds in. Um, I don't know about Steve, but a lot of guys started bringing birds in like the 60s and 70s, and that was the beginning of captive breeding. So the exotics haven't been around in a super long time. Is, so it, is it the same process as, say, reptiles, where, you know, there's an importation process? Yeah. And or however the hell they got here in the <laughs> 60s and 70s? Some form of Quotation marks? Yeah, I mean, it's, I won't claim to know the full process, but I know there's like CITES and all that stuff involved as well, just like, you know, reptiles. Seems like it'd be much harder to smuggle in <laughs> one of these animals than a snake. That's true. <laughs> and and their um, importation is still kind of on like the like the, it's getting better and better as we go. Like 
there's a lady in, I want to say like Holland, who's now, um, they're doing like these trial runs, importing even new exotic words that we've never had before. So it's still increasing. Now, is there any crossover as far as like, obviously people keep birds as pets, but this is totally so different. But mm -hmm. is there crossover of people who are interested in pet birds and, and falconry? Wow. So yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about people who keep parrots and keep um, raptors. Right. Or keep raptors as a pet only. No, I mean, just people who do both. But, I mean, do people keep raptors as pets only? <laughs> yeah. So, the first part, yeah. There bird people, you know, there are people who are bird people who are both avid falconers and they keep, um, you know, parrots or, or other sort of captive um, exotic birds as pets. Um, yeah, that's pretty common. One of my friends just got a macaw and she is a really awesome falconer. Um, and then and then there are people that we not so affectionately refer to pet keepers and that's something that's very stigmatized for falconers. Is, really? Yeah, is if you don't you don't tr like train and hunt with your birds. It's your it's kind of frowned upon to be a pet keeper. Well, it just seems like a waste of a lot of money and time just to have it chill out. I don't know. It's kind of unfair to the bird too, and that's what that's why it's such a stigmatized thing. Because they're not birds that are meant to just sit. They're meant they're their natural thing is to yeah, be. Yeah, but in I, the think, I think I think that's interesting though because obviously we have stigma probably more so towards people who live feed. We're like, why would you ever live feed? And that's showing its instincts. But at the same time, if you don't have that, it's different, I guess, when a bird's flying around a lot, but. They're going to get it. We are feeding our snakes. This, they are going to get it. Yeah, you can feed your, your hawk, I guess. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, you know, people, like I said, people look at it kind of as like a, as like, why do you have this bird? Is You know, it's kind of an ego thing. Why do you have this? pet if you're not gonna let it do what it naturally does um but but in kind of to what you said is some people frown upon certain types of falconry because it's you know dangerous like live feeding would be so like some people say you really shouldn't hunt squirrels because squirrels can bite toes and bite toes off mm. you know? Devil. i knew i hated squirrels for a reason <laughs> yeah so but then also i might hunt them to get rid of them. <laughs> There's a lot of squirrels out there. Yeah, if we killed every squirrel in the world, it'd be Wow, totally you're a terrible it. person. Okay. How does that make me a terrible person? There's squirrels. Well, see, this is the exact <laughs> attitude that, you know, this is why the rattlesnake roundhouse exists, because people like you think I'm that not gonna you create should get rid of every rattlesnake. Yes, I bet that. you will. I... <laughs> I'm okay without squirrels in the world. Wow, you're a bad There's person. There's other animals who do. Be known. <laughs> squirrels are cute. No? <laughs> they're devils. They're little what? devils. You have never squirrel never done anything to you, but I'll send yeah. you pictures of the three baby squirrels we're we're uh, rehabilitating right now. You might change. You might change your mind. Ooh, so you guys, do you take in like all kinds of rehabs? Yeah. So, um, so we kind of have like a, our specialty. Um, that way we can specialize in certain things. My wife is mainly small mammals. So she does possums, squirrels, um, and things of that nature. And uh, I do, I used to do raptors and reptiles. Um, I still do the occasional reptile, but generally I kind of took over doing waterfowl conservation and rehabilitation. You should introduce her to Melissa. Melissa loves squirrels. <laughs> and possums. I feel so bad. I'm like, I hate squirrels and I hate she, possums. She devotes her life to saving I, squirrels. I, and you're I, over here. I did see, remember I saw one squirrel I did actually like, when we the, were the, the, the melanistic squirrels, one, yeah. I saw a melanistic one, and I Black really liked cool. that one. That was like the only one. But squirrels were crazy at LSU. They were double, and, and they had a little bite. No, those college everywhere. squirrels would like come up to you and <laughs> right. Take they're your psycho. Food. I think they're just used to pooping <laughs> everywhere on a college campus, and that's and just stupid like, college kids who are trying to get as close yeah, as right. possible. Yeah, right. So college squirrels ruined me. College squirrels. <laughs> they sound like they're a little habituated. <laughs> They need a payment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll bring some animals to LSU. So, them to so, like rehabilitation, how do you manage doing basically the predator and their prey kind of at the same time? <laughs> That's actually a like a question I get a lot. And like, you literally rehab all the animals that you turn around and hunt. Uh, but you know, it's like most, just like most hunters. 
um, people have like that misconception that it's just like murder for fun, but we are some of the most like conservationally minded people. You know, we have organizations like Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, Ducks Unlimited. Um, and so we are invested in making sure that not only raptors, but, but their prey have a really strong, healthy population. And how does um, someone basically, how does the process work as far as bringing in animals? For rehab? Yeah. And so we vol like we are basically like volunteers with um, a, like a regional organization. And so uh, they have like, there's a lot of ton of even more, you thought falconry is bad, but for wildlife rehab, there's even more permitting involved in that. And so um, they, they have federal and state permits to do wildlife rehabilitation. And what, I guess we can go through another process. How do you, <laughs> how do you get a, basically get qualified to be a wildlife rehabilitator? That one, you know, I'm not quite as familiar with the in-depth um, things that that requires, but there's, and it's all regional again. Um, but yeah, so there's a ton of things in it. It's even more, you have your own set of regulation for housing. Falcon, your falconry muse wouldn't pass an inspection for, for rehabilitation for the most part, um, depending on the muse. But it's it's way more. It's like basically it's you have to have two quality enclosures. Just the same inspection as like a zoo. And so when you're rehabilitating, say birds, I mean, what's the extent as far as like medically you can do? Do you work with a vet or do you do it all yourself? Yeah, so we do, um, when they come in, we'll do like a triage and kind of assess the severity of it. And generally, um, if it's an orphan baby, um, we generally don't need to take it to a vet. We're able to just kind of um, rehydrate and, and start, you know, care. But if it's not a baby and it's an injured um, animal, generally it will have to involve a vet um, and get it whatever medical attention it needs. Um, and then we can start doing, you know, the process from there. Like, for example... Last season, I had a baby, bar, three baby barn owls. Two of them, we were just able to hydrate and, and start the rehabilitation process. And the third one had um, a, kind of a leg, like deformity called splay leg, where its leg was out like this. And so we had to take it to a vet um, and get it assessed. And they gave us like a special um, binding we had to put on the leg. And I this is going to sound like we're crazy bird people probably because we are, but we had to take it with us to work and give it like physical therapy like five times a day help reshape the leg, you know, and so oh you got the forest gum treatment, you got the <laughs> yeah. <racing>. yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's once again a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All of this. I mean you literally have to have a ridiculous amount of love for these things to go through this. And are you is it a similar process as far as um trying to interact with the bird or are you trying to do like zero interaction with something that you're mm -hmm. rehabbing? Yes, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. So it's like it's, it's minimal interaction um, because you you don't want, especially for orphaned animals. Um, older animals are kind of a little more, you know, they they're a little easier to work with. Um, but the orphans, you really don't want them to imprint on you for like birds because then they're non-releasable. So it's really important that you kind of um, give them food without them associating you with food or interaction. Is there a way that you can kind of have them hunt? Is it a live prey thing, or are you just going to throw a, a mouse in there? How does that work? Um, so, like, when they're babies, they grow up, then we put them in, like, a, like a large outdoor flight cage. Gen sometimes, depending on the animal and, and the safety of it, with other animals of their own species, um, if it's a threat to themselves, they'll get their own flight cage. Uh, but then, generally, we do kind of with a similar hacking process, like you would... Um, like you would with, with a bird you're re-releasing, just to make sure that they're effectively hunting for themselves. We'll provide them food until they start hunting on their own. Now I guess we can get more personal, per se. Have you ever had a bird Why fly away? Why do you have to say it like that, you weirdo? <laughs> I just want to make them unexpected with a normal question. After that, <laughs> Have you personally had a bird fly away and not come back? Permanent, so yeah, this is generally nine out of ten falconers will lie to you. No, never, ever. But <laughs> I'll say not permanently. Um, when I actually got my last Harris hawk, he had so when I had my red tails, I had a leg mount on him um, with his radial telemetry, 
and it was fine. It never was an issue um, with like a leather strip called a Bewit. And when I got my Harris Hawk, they're pretty they're pretty intelligent birds, like um, above average intelligence for raptors. And so I was flying him, and he took off and just bolted. And I think you saw some, some ground squirrels in the field over. <laughs> he hadn't done it in a while, so I got like all <laughs> sense of security. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's still a bird. Secrets out. <laughs> and so, um, and so he took off, you know, to the field next door for probably saw a ground squirrel over there. And so I pulled out my my receiver and I started to track him, thinking no big deal, I'll find him, I'll call him down, and we'll call it a day. And when I tracked him, I looked around, I didn't see him. And I looked down, I saw his transmitter on the ground. Mm. And it was just, you know, kind of a rookie mistake. And uh, and so basically I lived in that area out of my car for like three days because now I had no way to locate him other than just like hoping I saw him. And uh, well, I knew once I saw him, you know, I'd be able to call him down to me and we'd be on our merry way. But so, you know, I slept in my car and I was a mess and I was driving around, driving around looking for him. Um, and finally, like on the third day, it was like, I think I lost him like on a Thursday night and like it was a Sunday morning. Um, I like, so when you, when I lost him, I like kind of one of the tricks I was using is I was like looking for abnormal wild bird behavior. And I saw a group of crows kind of dive bombing um, like this one area and I, followed to where they're at and actually was at our facility, like on one of our wine tanks where we lost them. And, uh, and there, sure enough, three days later, there was my bird sitting on top of this tank. And I was like, Oh, he's going to be so hungry. Poor guy. I went to calm down and he kind of like, like scoffed at me. I'm like, okay. And so I like brought out his lure and I threw it and he did come down for the lure. Um, but I was like, that's really weird. Like he has to be starving. And I put him on the scale and he was like, his flying weight 700 grams. He was like 800 and, 30 so clearly he was out had a buffet out there <laughs> oh, yeah so he must have gotten bored or, or cold and decided to come back to the tank and look for me so i i guess that's a good example though that they're gonna go right back to being wild animals after yeah, you're done with them in a sense a great bird you know he was just did his, his in following his instincts and okay oh sorry go that's okay no i was saying he's just following his instincts but uh but yeah, they're able to fend for themselves. And um, after that, I went out and bought a backpack and a GPS. And I was like, we're never going through this again. <laughs> You're not losing him again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was just a rookie mistake. But falconry is like the – it's people joke. It's like the highest of highs and lowest of lows, you know. So like a week later, we were out just having the time of our life. We caught like two rabbits and a quail in one day. It was like the best day of falconry I've ever had within a span of like five days. <laughs> But can you can you fly in a group like that with other like falconers? So for most species, no. Um, falcons are pretty like pretty solitary. Um, but one of the one of the big attractions to this type of bird, as well as Oplomato falcons, is they're actually pretty social, especially the Harris hawks. Um, and so you can fly them in a, in what's called a cast, which means like two birds that fly together in tandem. And you can fly them like group hawk with a group of your friends too, as long as the birds have been properly socialized. Mm. So it's what? kind of, it's really cool to watch. Like you can fly, and they, they're smart, so they'll learn. So like you could fly, like a male and a female, and you'll see like the male just like kind of be the flusher, and he's fast and agile. He'll move in, he'll flush game, like jackrabbit, which he can never catch. And then he knows that if he flushes and gets a move in, the female will move in, and she's big and powerful, and she'll be able to grab that jackrabbit. And then he'll wait for her to like in the wild, wait for her to take her fill, and then he'll move in and get his. But they they really are smart and they work in tandem, like almost like wolf packs. What a and gentleman! I know. I was thinking that the whole time. Chivalry yeah. isn't dead in the hair and stock <laughs> world. And the females are also the alphas, so that doesn't hurt. <laughs> Do you have what sex are yours? I have two males. Okay, was that by choice, by happenstance? And is that visually done as far as sexing goes? So, like, they don't really have a ton of like sexual dimorphism for hair socks. It's general, and, and actually, most raptor species. Um, some do like the American kestrel, but most of the species is just done by size. The male is usually smaller. And so, like, if you trap a red tail that's like 1,200 grams, it's, it's distinctly a female. And if you trap a 
one that's like 700 grams is distinctly a male. Um, there's some right. gray area between, and you can do DNA testing if it really, if you really care, but generally we don't, unless you're breeding. Gotcha. So did you want two males? Did it just happen that way, or? Yeah. So I got, and you know, I'm sure some doctors may say I'm wrong, but because they are, uh, two reasons, because they are generally the betas, um, they I think that they socialize and fly together better because. You know they're they're less um, they're less trying to they're trying to be less dominant, mm -hmm. uh, and also they're a little bit faster and more agile, so they fly better on the game I want. We don't really have jackrabbits here, which is um, what a female would be really well suited to hunt. But we have a ton of cottontails and fast flying birds, so a, a faster male would be a better choice. Uh, bunch of cops, those males, hops. <laughs> 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 Your face right now. How do I don't you, know if I'm thinking of that word in the way. Yeah, yeah I think you, you are. Want me to think but, of that uh, word? How do you think you're the worst? Is that what yes, I should be thinking? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you? You, Not PG you mentioned guys. That was awesome. You mentioned socializing. So mm -hmm. how does one socialize two birds? Yeah, there's different processes, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I generally start by like tethering them with an eyesight of each other to their perches. So they kind of get used to each other's presence. Within a few minutes, they'll kind of sit and ignore each other. Um, and then generally, like, I'll move them kind of closer and closer until they're within, like, they're still not able to reach each other, but they're pretty close. Um, I may start feeding them around one another. And then I will have another person help me. My poor wife generally gets volunteered, but she will hold one on the glove and I'll fly one. And then, um, I fly tether one to the glove while the other flies around it and then I'll alternate go back and forth you know and as long as we're not having any incidents that way then I'll try to fly them together it's just je like kind of like a gentle introduction over time what does an altercation look like when you're kind of in the middle of it <laughs> <laughs> luckily I've only seen it like once or twice but um, it, it can be anything from like flying by and kind of like swooping them to actually like they call it grabbing, they'll bind to them with their talons. And that's actually kind of a dangerous thing if they get their center mass. So you really want to be vigilant, but that's why it's nice to have two people is because like, if you see another bird flying in and they're flying at the bird on your glove, you can kind of roll your back um, and, and put yourself between the birds so that they don't actually make contact. It's just safer. And you're not really seen as anything that they can defend themselves against or they don't involve you right if you turn your back are you opening yourself up to no i mean they won't they generally won't grab you they they'll they'll fly off or or you can put your arm out. i've never had one they just kind of like uh, they like they'll kind of like fly up and ignore you you do that this is like a, a new oh, question yeah, that i hate probably. people asking about like snakes but i mean do they bite claw all that good <laughs> stuff <laughs> um so yeah, I mean, it's a good question, I think. But so they can, depending on the circumstances. Generally, it's handler air. Once you man them down the first like week or so, um, they generally don't. But like if it's misimprinted or you've created some sort of food or, or fear association, the falcons tend to bite, and hawks will tend to foot you. But you know they can both do both. And what is basically why would they do that? I mean, what are the mistakes that you can make that would lead to that? Like, for example, if you had a bird that um, you kind of were, you had it tethered to the glove and you were handling its feet too rough and it really didn't like that and it reached out and grabbed you. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a snake to me. Um, it would reach out and grab your hand and it got a response, which is you removing your hand and it had, you know, the desire to result it's now learned, hey, if I grab your, your hand or bite you, you'll stop touching me in a way I don't want. And so actually this bird, when I got him, the handler that had him before, clear, clearly he had some sort of like defensive issues with his feet. And so I had to work him through that a little bit. But yeah, he, he wasn't like a food association or anything. He just kind of um, didn't like his feet touched and he thought that would be effective. So are you essentially just letting the bird always come to you and you're like not manipulating him too hard in order to get him not to give you that response? Um, what was the question? 
<laughs> like, are you, so does that mean that you need to be less hands-on with the animal and like, yeah, how do you go about building, going from that defensive nature to building to where you are now? So, I mean, if you avoid that initially, that's definitely going to be the easiest, which actually means like lots of touching, you know, like um, when you're manning it, you just gently introduce your hands, you kind of gently touch the feet, the chest and the keel. Um, and eventually, like I like to touch the head and the back um, because it gets them used to um, kind of if you're approaching them to hood or mount. You guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's if you're gonna hood them or put a backpack mount on them, it kind of gets them used to touching you in those areas. Um, but once once it's already the damage is already done with this bird, the route I took to kind of rectify that was. <laughs> was oh, um, sorry, I, just I, I wasn't just sure. I didn't check it. I didn't check if the mics were on before, so now I'm like, damn. Let me check if they're on. This is a good time, but they well, are. He can hear us, so how? Else? Yeah, he heard me blow into it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know that that would be so distracting. Well, it's just weird. Um, so I like just put like, kind of a glove on my offhand and just kind of like a snake that's defensive. You would try to create positive associations, um, holding it every day for a week or so, you know, two weeks, whatever it took until they had that positive association with humans and it brought down their defensive nature a little bit. So I just put a glove on and I touched his feet gently and then once he stopped trying to claw it, I stopped touching it. Simple. I'm right. so, I'm I, such an idiot for not checking. No, but before. I just checked the settings. It's not pulling it from the mic. I know, which makes me more of an idiot. But at least you can no, hear we us. We don't need these. Oh, basically, okay. <laughs> just act like we're talking into him. <laughs> we just You're making me nervous. It's coming from the camera. Not... This is our first podcast. <laughs> yeah. uh, we just. We're a little late and didn't go through our normal thing. But it showed. I had no idea if you didn't say anything. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I, I will know tomorrow when I'm editing it and it doesn't sound as good. But I'll that's so good that the webcam picks it up, you know, like can pick it up. Yeah, it's going to pick it up shittily for <laughs> lack of better words. But you're good at editing, so you can edit it betterly. No, I mean, yeah, it will it will be listenable for sure, That's but let's stop talking. Great. Let's stop talking about it. Okay, question. Um, <laughs> the rest of our questions are probably going to be about comparing the Falcon Reworld to Snake World, but that's all I know. Um, is there, like in the Snake World, is there a set of, like, old school guys who, like, do it one way, and then there's, like, the new way, or is there any of that going on? Absolutely, yeah. So, um... And I mean, the, the two kind of intersect, but so hair socks were kind of actually like a revolution in the falconry world. They're really forgiving. They're really easy to work with. And because they live in that social kind of hierarchy, they're pretty well suited because now you don't have to teach them to tolerate a human and work in tandem. That's like part, part of their instincts. Um, and so like that's kind of the new age falconry is a lot of people flying hair socks on, on cottontails and jackrabbits. Um, and the old timey classic falconers, we're flying long wings, which are which are falcon, like the falcon group. We're flying them um, traditionally, teaching them to take that big pitch, and that's like the old school classic falconry. So you described that earlier. So are you an old school guy? <laughs> no, I'm definitely a new school guy. <laughs> I have all the socks. <laughs> but I'm not. Shoot, I, shoot, I'm not old enough to be an old school guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Uh, Age-wise, but still, yeah. I mean, even, you know, some reptile keepers are pretty old school, even if, you know, maybe their mentor was a certain yeah. old school kind of guy. So, yeah. Like, one of my friends is, like, a third-generation falconer, and he's very old school. Um, he hunts, you know, all falcons. For, for, the, for the most part, he hunts all falcons, and that's his thing, is long wings, and he wants to hunt ducks and sage grouse and all the, the, the OG falconry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I it partially is kind of a lazy thing. I don't like taking the, I don't like taking those like mile, two mile telemetry chases for my falcon because it decided to take off and chase something, and it's open for predation that whole time it's gone. You know, if it's on the ground eating something and it's two miles away and it takes you thirty minutes to get there because it's on private property, um, golden eagle or a big red tail could come in and easily kill your bird, and I don't really like, the you know the fear of that. Yeah, yeah. constantly having to worry about it. 
So it seems like doing it the new school way is just straight up a better way of doing it. I mean, like, that just seems from, from a logical standpoint. Well, so is it. It's, it's, it's better if you want to hunt rabbits, for sure, you know? If you don't want to hunt rabbits, it's definitely you're less effective at hunting. And it's oh. it's just something cool about watching that the aerial, like, the acrobatic nature of a falcon in a stoop. But, yeah, I mean... You're definitely more effective with a with a nice cast of hair socks. You could take two, three, four hundred head a game, or, or even a golf sock. You could take, you know, hundreds of, of things a year, and feed your birds and yourself. I like the vernacular there, the head of game. So that just means three hundred animals. Yeah, yeah. How <laughs> many different? Words. Yeah, I'm like I'm wondering, like, what other names there are for things. Well, I because I am. Uh, Inquisitive, uh, do you know why Tony? Why they're called mutes? No, I don't. It's like an old. I know it derives from an old term, and I'm trying to remember if it's. I think it's Latin that it derives from. Maybe um, if Wikipedia is correct, which is not always, <laughs> the word muse comes from the French word mur, which means to change, because falconry birds were, were put in mews while they were molting. There you go. That's awesome. Thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> like, sure my brain will just that. didn't understand, like, why news? Like, I just don't get it. I thought it was named after Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Falconer didn't happen until Pokemon. Yep. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. There's another word he said earlier. I wanted to look that up, but I don't remember. Yeah, that's, like I just, like mentioned before, there's just a whole own, whole own vernacular for this sport. And so, like, when I – People ask me like how to start. I'm like, like studying for their test. I'm like, honestly, I'd start with the glossary and make flashcards and memorize the words because otherwise, when you're studying, it's going to sound like gibberish. And that so that test is that more is it more based on what you do with the birds in captivity? Is it about the birds themselves? Like, what are the questions on a test like that? I would say it's pretty well rounded. It kind of covers a little bit of everything, and I think the goal is just to make sure like you've done you're competent and you've done a diligent amount of like background work educating yourself um so that this bird's going to be in good hands and so like i would say it covers a good balance of like the rules and regulations um individual care and identification of the birds themselves um husbandry um hunting regulations and techniques you know it's kind of a good well-rounded test yeah, and Carly in the chat said, like, because obviously we talked about French words. Obviously, we, talk we talked a little bit about, like, European yep. uh, falconers and stuff like that. Like, are do people just practice falconry all over the world? Yeah, so, I mean, the falconry is, like, the sport of kings, you know. It's, like, one of the oldest um, known known sports. And there's they actually don't know officially, like, where falconry, falconry originated um, because it was, like, you know, the Mongols used to and still fly golden eagles on foxes. Um, you know, in, in the Middle East, they fly, like, sacred falcons. And then um, it's kind of just popped up all over the world throughout time. Yeah, it seems like it could have been the fact, like, people are doing it across the world without even knowing that other people are doing it. It just It's like an innate human uh, <laughs> thing to take a bird for some reason. And I don't know. It seems yeah. the last thing I would try yeah. to figure out if oh, I was. I don't know. You getting into birds lately? No, nah, I'd make a bow and arrow or some shit. I don't <laughs> want to fuck with these beasts from the sky. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely got rich. Uh, it's got like here's I don't know. It's kind of a weird tidbit information, but I find it fascinating. It's such a rich history that in like um, like medieval medieval um, Europe. They had a hierarchy of um, who could fly what type of birds, you know? So, like, the ladies would fly the Merlins and, like, so on and so forth. Um, you know, each different social class allowed you to fly a better bird, essentially. Wow. wow. <laughs> that was, like, a sign of class. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you're, like, big breathing bird that's <laughs> And it, it seems like it hasn't really come to, like, I want to say the modern age in a sense as far as, like, the gear that you guys use. GPS it all seems very, modern well, age. obviously. What are you talking about? But I mean, like, the very brass yeah. tacks and 
the very like the glove and the hood and stuff, it still looks very like handmade. What well, you switch to be like a robotic arm? No, <laughs> it'll be like fucking what do you polyester think? or something. <laughs> Some modern synthetic age fabric. Glove. No, I mean you don't you don't wear leather gloves anymore, do you? Yeah. yeah well, you may, but you, most people. <laughs> My gloves are leather. Those are though. not the best gloves, though. They keep them warm. Okay, whatever. But you know what I'm getting at, right? No. With the exception of GPS and radio telemetry, falconry is practiced almost identical to the way it was, like you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago. So yeah, it's it's definitely something like that's you know kind of the sport is known for really sticking with tradition, and we still read a lot of the the books like, you know, the Art of Falconry by Frederick II is still like commonly kept by most falconers, and so things have changed very little with the few exceptions. That's kind of crazy in comparison to say reptiles, which is like everything's changed in a sense. Right. Yeah, I keep reptiles differently now than I did ten years ago. You know. Well, let's get into that, shall we? Right. Well, no, I wanted to. I wanted to ask. I mean, are okay. people are these? Are, is the equipment made by individuals, like handmade by individuals, or are there like commercial companies that are making them in high numbers? So, um, so both, I would say, um, depending on what it is. There's mass-produced falconry gear, but there's a lot of people that are still either like hand-making gear um, and selling it, and a lot of falconers get into like the DIY aspect of it too. Like I make all my own anklets and jesses. Um, Wait, what's, I, what's that? What's that? What's that what's second word? Jesses. Oh, so yeah, it's part of like the it's called alimary jesses, and so the anklets have a grommet um, or a hole that you put um, a strip of either leather or like braided dacron or or you know some sort of rope, and each anklet has that attached to a swivel. And the swivel is attached to its leash. That way, awesome. <laughs> so it's, it's basically like the restraint system, but it's been used, you know, forever, just like we were talking about. So that's like you're basically holding on to a tether. Exactly. Yeah. So if you, you kind of can't see it, but yeah. So he has he has his anklets, um, and each of them has a rope, and it's attached to a swivel, and that swivel has like probably like a two foot leash that I'm holding. And now, like. I see some with bells on them and stuff. Is that just to find your animal, or why are there bells on them? So the bells, it's it's half practical and half tradition. So traditionally, people put bells on their birds because they didn't have, you know, GPS or telemetry, and it helps a lot. Like if that bird goes down in like three, four foot brush with game, you know, you could walk right by it and not, and not see it. But the bells kind of at least give you a direction to hear where which direction the bird is. Um, now, obviously, it's semi-obsolete with, with telemetry, um, but it's kind of a tradition. And, and it, you know, it is kind of helpful. Um, just always be able to hear where they're at without pulling out your phone or your receiver, um, especially for me doing abatement in an urban area. You yeah. want to be able to hear them as much as possible. Exactly, yeah. You, like, at a second's notice, you know what direction he is at least. I can imagine that there's, like, a lot more obstacles as far as, like I've seen, I think it was a video of you in an urban environment, like just looked like in the back of a building, getting all these crows away. Like there's cars, there's obviously just more people, more animals involved. I mean, what are, what are the kind of things, how do you make sure that your bird's safe during all that? Yeah. So what the, there's different types of um, abatement. And so, like I mentioned before, like the agricultural um, landfills for like seagulls and, and pest birds resorts. Uh, and then what we do is like it's urban abatement essentially you know and so a lot of people actually just opt not to do urban abatement um, because there are more risks associated with it especially for like i think the company i work for is one of the first companies to do urban crow abatement because it's dangerous and a lot of people you know thought it might not be effective and so there's things we do. Um, we train our hawks to a laser, which is like one of the main things. And what that does is like we can point a, a green laser at wherever we want them to perch. Um, and that way we can kind of direct where they go and try to keep them in a safe location and then make sure that when we call them down that there's a safe flyway between where they're perched and where we are to kind of minimize the risks. Because for crows, you have to do it in at sundown essentially 
Mm. And why is that? Um, so the way, at least in our area um, and a lot of metropolitan areas, is it's like a city surrounded by ag land. And so what's happening is the crows are migrating to this area um, like during, you know, September, October. And they're eating all day in the urban air or the agriculture areas or feasting. And then they come into the city because it's warm and it's safe, safer um, to roost at night. So they'll come in and they'll congregate and they'll stage in big groups. And then they'll move to their final rest for the evening. And so like if you go out there at one in the afternoon and try to work, there wouldn't be a crow in sight. So you have to as they're coming in. And what makes them as far as, I mean, do they come back or even with the starlings and stuff, what makes them kind of stay away from that area? Persistence. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so our contracts that, that last that whole October to April, um, we're in the same project area that the city has de designated for us. And so for the, usually it just depends on the area, but generally it takes about a month to six weeks to get them out of that area and to stop returning every night. And uh, once they're out, it's just basically just continuing to, to let them know that not only is there a predator in that area, but he's here to stay. And so they, till they opt to permanently relocate. And now um, the chat, Carly in the chat said there was a guy do I guess doing a news interview who was flying his bird and it just flew off and then went and got hit by a semi truck. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, that's definitely the uh, the like the fear, you know, every day when you do it. But he probably shouldn't have been leaving it loose while he was doing an interview. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, is that like I feel like falconry must be one of those things where if something happens like that, like you guys would send videos to each other, like look at this idiot kind of guy. I mean, do you guys all know each other and like all? kind of yeah like definitely regionally you know like there's a there's a community aspect where like and there's definitely a facebook community it's kind of similar to the reptile facebook community. is it as frustrating yeah i mean it's a <laughs> preference but you know people are just as opinionated and um and stuff but there's some really good people on there too but yeah there's definitely, right <laughs> definitely some but and that's the other thing too is like falconry is like a lot of falconers are like really old you know so it's like your uncle being on Facebook. Yeah, and I think that was, I mean, that was probably the case in reptiles until recently. Now I feel like every younger kid has Facebook and there's a lot of younger people into it now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, they, they kind of remind me of each other, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I guess any small group of people who gather around animals and for whatever reason, I mean, like it's a living being, so your opinion oh, uh, yeah. carries or weight in your own head, I feel like, because you're like, I want to do right by my animal. This is right. You're, you know, like, it's yeah. just a recipe for people to be shitty to each other in a way. Absolutely, man. It's like, it's okay. I mean, in a lot of things, it's okay to respect one another's opinion, but to a lot of people, it's like, oh, well, my opinion is life and death. You know, the life of my animal depends on me doing things right. And to them, you know, it's like you got to have that mentality that my way is not the only way to effectively keep and be successful with these animals. But a lot right, of <laughs> right. And let's let's I guess talk a little bit of obviously there's a giant barrier to entry. Like it's basically taking you seven years to get where you're at. And is it fruitful as far as if someone was to say, I want to be a professional professional falconer? I mean, is that something that you can strive for, you know, with intent? I mean, it's something you can do, but personally, I don't think it's the most, unless you love doing it because you love working with the birds, I don't think it's the most, it's not like a money, a quick, just like breeding steaks, it's not a get rich quick thing, you know, it's like, it's a ton of work, man. You're caring for these birds, 365, um, the pay is exceedingly average, Um it sounds like a lot, but when you consider the amount of care and time and all that stuff and money that goes into it, it's it's something you can do and make a career out of for sure. But it's not something that I would recommend unless you just love doing it. Right. Yeah. It seems like obviously you have to spend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just weighing the animal twice a day is more yeah. than most snake keepers do. <laughs> all the other stuff. Weighing every snake in your collection twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. 
but uh, I guess we should talk about snakes. Why not? Now that we have like 20 minutes left, let's talk about snakes. Uh, so what are you into? It seems like you're into, you have like ball pythons retics. Yeah, I mainly, um, I mainly keep like in numbers, ball pythons and articulated pythons, um, numbers being relative, I guess. Um, but then I do have some other stuff, you know, that I keep just for fun because I enjoy keeping snakes. Um, I keep, always keep Suriname boas because I love, that's like my favorite snake and that's what got me into it. Um, some colubrids and oddball colubrids, um, what else? Uh, that's that's really it, you know. Um, I used to keep a ton of exotic stuff, like breed, like keep things in trios and pairs and breed them. And I just kind of got frustrated um, creating kind of more, like selling more high requirement animals, you know, and and people killing them or or you know, it's like you have to vet every single person so extremely, and and I care about all these animals, so it's it was it was hard, and it was like if I want to breed on a commercial. Not commercial, but if I want to breed like snakes, I want to make sure it's something that there's a demand for, you know, and people are able to care for. So now mainly I, I sell ball pythons. I do a few retic pairings. Right on. What kind of uh, the oddball colubrids? What do you have in that? Now I pretty much have um, muserana. I have um, some hognose, and then. Um, I had, I still kicked myself. I sold a nice pair of Eastern Indigos. And I'll probably get some dry mark on, yeah, later on down the road, maybe some Indigos and some some Prebos. Right on. That's cool stuff. So are you, as far as the uh, reptiles go, what numbers are we talking? Um, so breeder ball pythons, I have about 60. Um, I usually, I and I have about... 50 babies left from from last season and i think i produced like you know 80 babies a season try to keep it as a hobby you know so it's like not too much to maintain and then retics i have uh i have like six breeder retics oh i have a berm too i have a berm um i have uh six breeder retics and about four that i'm growing up that are like you know hold back animals or grow ups but I mean that will that will produce probably more than those ball pythons just off of puberty picks. Yeah, and you know I, <laughs> that's true. I like to be pretty specific about my pairings because like the world doesn't need a ton of huge snakes that you know there's not a demand for. So if I if I really feel strongly about a pairing um, and I think that there's going to be a demand for it and I'll I'll do it. So like I think this year I'm only pairing two of my two of my females out of out of five. So. Yeah, but you still, I feel like, downplayed the fact. I mean, still that many snakes. He has like 60 breeder balls. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, and he does a, a couple of retake pairings a year. That's still, he has, what do you, you said you're producing like 80 babies a year or so? Yeah, last season I produced, uh, yeah, like 70 to 80 ball pythons. And then this year I'll probably produce, you know, my goal is essentially I have like a 70 30, and I'll never probably have more than like 30 female ball pythons because that's kind of like my limit you know i don't want to have over 20 to 25 clips here and are you uh the investor guy or what do you do when it with ball pythons are you high end what are you working with yeah so that's that's kind of my goal is like instead of just producing a lot of snakes is like to work, i work almost exclusively with like receptive stuff um and so that's my goal is like to keep those 30 females and if i have another hold back i'll just place on my females with you know maybe something a little bit um like a visual like i place a head with a visual um, and so i work with um kind of a little bit of everything for hats uh clown i work with clown stuff puzzle stuff um pied stuff like xanthic stuff desert ghost stuff you know so kind of kind of a little bit of everything and i'll build up from there right now you can do your snake questions now Forgot no, my question. Well, I did forget them, but my questions were like comparing snake to mm -hmm. bird stuff, which I feel like we have a lot. Did yeah. you ever <laughs> uh, like con not confused, but like mix up the words? Don't the jar that. No, no, the jargon. I'm talking about the jargon, like you know, like forget, not forget. You know what I'm trying Hopefully to say? Hopefully, you're like, snake and mew. Yeah, say like, oh, it's <laughs> mew. I, I think it's mute today or something like that, or does your brain just able to separate it? 
Um, for the most part, I separated, but I've definitely a couple times like transposed the lingo like once or twice, you know. And like, um, generally, it's like with snake people, I'll say like something falcon related, and they'll just kind of look at me like, "What does that gibberish word you just said?" You know. <laughs> but yeah, they're definitely like, such a distinct part of like you know my day to day, and they have more so, more so. I would say I just use the jargon in my daily like conversations and people for both and people are like what are you talking about and i forget that it's not normal <laughs> yeah i guess the thing that everyone has in common who does something like this is that if you talk to other people like normal civilians i guess we could call them you're gonna be a weirdo if you're whether you're a falconer or a reptile keeper slash breeder you're Okay. He's a dull dose. He has to be like, I keep our pals and I think, but I, think people, I think there's almost more respect for someone who goes balls deep like that. Well, I think people think <laughs> like, it sounds cool. Yeah, you know, like this is gonna, people are gonna be mad, but like yeah. snakes don't always like sound cool. Mostly, but like falconry, I feel like everyone's like, wow, like it's all you know. It's like it's barbaric, not barbaric. You know, it's kind of like hunter gatherer, like yeah. I don't know. It sounds yeah, cool. For sure. I mean, it's like uh, all I know. I, I am glad I'm married because dating is like, hey, not only do I have a whole room of snakes, but I <laughs> stuff with, with giant pterodactyl, you know, with raptors and birds of prey. It, it, <laughs> but people think people think falconry is cool generally until it gets on brass tacks and like, oh, that's pretty disgusting, you know, like or, or or they realize it's actually like you're you're it's a hunting sport. You're killing things at the end of the day, and so it's pretty gruesome, and they kind of fix it up. I think time. the the thing that was the most weird for me is that I was watching this girl training and she has to like cut up all the mice. Like you can't just feed them a mouse. She was like cutting up damn parts of the she was mice. A butcher. Yeah. Yeah. You you make people like well how do you feed them tidbits? And I'm like well don't ask the question you don't want the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> feed them tidbits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know you have to do that. So, do you, do you have to be like mindful of like the organs and stuff like that? Do you have to do you have to gut them first or do anything weird? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, like it's people do different things. Like they'll feed whole prey items. Personally, if I'm cutting them up and I'm I'm making tidbits, I do like to eviscerate. Like, uh, you know what I mean? To eviscerate them and like remove the like the guts. Um, just for the sake of that. But other than that, I leave all the internal organs and and all the meat and bone and feet and you know. All that good stuff because that's all the calcium for them they need, and then and it, tidbit seems to be the accepted term. Yeah, tidbit, the, tidbit is the is the the vernacular there for just like a tiny little chopped up bit. It sounds so cute. It's definitely not. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then that that kind of thing is for training purposes. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how you start the training process. You get them to accept food from you. And then they're eating off the glove. And then you will, um, once they kind of trust you and they're eating off the glove a little bit, you'll move your glove a little bit further away from them. And this is kind of like the biggest hurdle. Um, and you move it just out of reach for them. And they have to take just a little hop on or step onto your glove. Um, and it sounds like nothing, but for some reason, that's like the point where it clicks to them. Like, oh, he wants me to kind of work for my food. He'll feed me as long as I'm willing to do, you know, and generally, by the end of that training session, once it clicks, you just move it further and further away incrementally. Um, generally, they'll be going from the leap to about halfway across the garage, um, and then, you, yeah, and then you'll increase the distance from there pretty much daily. Um, once they're reliably coming across the garage, we take them outside on another jargon for you. Is it, it's called a creance. It's basically a long line that's weighted, and then you take them outside and you attach that to their swivel. To their swivel and you will um, put them on a perch and you'll start just the same process hop and move further and further until about it, it's different in length but generally 100 to 150 yards is good um, and weighted to make it hard make them have to work more no so so the the weighted portion is put in like the middle and so that's only a you don't want a bird to be able to fly 50 yards and have like a dead stop because it's really bad for for their legs um, and so the weighted portion is just to create enough drag so that if for some reason they take off on you, um, it creates enough drag where they'll gently kind of land back on the ground um, and you can go recover the bird and try again. But it's just a way to help prevent losing your bird. Yeah, so it seems like even though 
I mean, they seem so powerful. They are kind of light and like they don't they won't take off with. I mean, how how heavy is that weight? It's, it's so you want to be able to vary it depending on the species you're using. Um, if you have a kestrel, it's going to be you know like a like a small tiny stick you know tied to the, the end of it. You can wind the rope around. Um, but for bigger birds like Harris hawks um, or red tails and stuff, I essentially use like a, a piece of PVC with caps on it. Um, and then the, the rope is twisted around there, like the, the, the string. Um, and then if you if you have like a lighter bird, you can just do it empty. And then if you have a big female red tail, you can fill it with something like sand or whatever you need to get the required the required weight. Oh, so that's uh, cool. it's, so you can kind of vary it depending on what you're working with at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's not ever how everyone does it, but that's kind of the style that I've used. Just because, you know, I like to be able to vary it, but it's really, if you do it, it's better to err on the side of, too light than too heavy because their bones are all and you don't want to do any sort of you know you don't want to injure them yeah that which is weird because you're like i would think like i definitely don't want to lose my bird let me make it, <laughs> heavy, make it so. heavy but that doesn't yep. sound like a good idea <laughs> so what kind of i mean we've had people asking and we live in an urban area and honestly, I know that there's a girl here in Philly that, that does falconry because I looked it up. But um, mm -hmm. typically, obviously, space requirements, you have you at least need a 10 by 10 cage. But are there is there legislation kind of like keeping reptiles in certain cities and ordinances and stuff like that? Um, I don't... I don't really know about... like. Are you talking about like specific uh, raptors or forbidden in specific like areas? Yeah, like even just keeping one at your house. I'm sure you know. I'm sure there's like cities somewhere that, you know, have have regulations specifically against it. But I, I mean, I haven't really heard of it. I don't think it's super common as far as falconry goes. And I don't know if that's because um, <laughs> cities are more lenient or because it's such a weird kind of uncommon thing that this is like they never saw a reason to do it yet. You know. And it's also like, I guess, the snake stigma is people think snakes are man eaters or, you know, <laughs> I guess, I mean, it may be a little bit different if you're talking about what's that, what's that, that eagle and uh, like the harpy eagle or something or the, the one that's in New Zealand? Yep. Uh, they, there's, the, I think you've seen uh, a harpy eagle has like this huge, it's like the largest raptor, I believe. I was like, yeah, yeah, like basically something that could pick you up <laughs> or at least a small child. Yeah, that would be a different story. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, I just think it's uncommon, so they, they never like saw a need for it. Yeah, and I guess also, I mean, most of the time you're talking native animals or, you know, animals that people have seen before. Mm -hmm. It's not something as foreign as, uh, you know, a retex or something tree like that. python or... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've noticed people's reaction to birds of prey is like totally opposite from snake. You know, like when they see a snake, like that is disgusting. Get away from me! Like it's not a lot of people, but everyone's like, that is so cool. You know, and they kind of walk up to you. Do people? I mean, it seems like people's tendency for any type of animal would be like, "Can I pet it?" Um, <laughs> what are what's the hands-on situation with hands -on the people? Situation is no go for for my birds. You know, like I mean, that's pretty much standard, but like. And I don't mind if people ask, like, that's, that's definitely one of the challenges of working in an urban environment is people coming up and talking to you. And then people, it's the first response is like, what do you do with an animal? You pet it. And so they, most people ask and they're pretty nice about it. But then sometimes you get people that just walk up and start come up. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, don't do that. And like, well, it's fine if it bites me. I'm like, it's really not, you know? <laughs> I'm like, well, it doesn't bite you. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of bonded to me, but um, yeah, it's, it depends on the bird and their temperament, but generally we don't let you know another, other people touch and fly our birds like riding another man's motorcycle. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you want to touch my highly adapted killing machine that I use for killing things? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. Such a good idea. This random person off the street who knows nothing about birds. And is it, I mean, is it more about the visual of the glove itself, or could you put your bare arm out there and it would come to you? I think it depends on the situation. It would probably come, like, fly down when you called it with your bare hand, but I don't, I really don't think it would land on there. Um, 
because the glove, they know it's, they're smart enough, they know it's not part of you. Um, and so I think I used the term earlier, they become like wedded to something. I um, mean, so they know that they associate it with food, you know, and so generally the bird will only land on the glove. Um, so and it, it seems like it has no interest in you. Oh, yeah. Like, it's not like right. looking at you or doing it. <laughs> no, yeah, really, it really, they know, it's kind of crazy. It's like, they just, I, I bring my birds with me to my office and they kind of sit on their perch and hang out with me all day, like right by my desk. And they just, we kind of mutually coexist and don't really pay much attention to each other. And then at the end of the day, like about like 3.30, uh, you know, our time, he'll start looking outside. He'll get a restless because he knows it's time to go fly, you know, and he'll, he'll come and like, he'll sit next to me and then I'll throw him in the box and we'll cruise out of the office and go fly. Wow. But it's just, it seems like it sees you as opportunity for it to go do fun things <laughs> instead right. of like bonding to you in any form. I'm the ends of the me. I'm a, an ends to a means, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely. They don't have like that. They, like I said, their brain's pretty reptilian. They don't have that like, like, positive association in my opinion like to people yeah i think that that's and talking to monitor keepers that's so yeah, similar it's weirdly similar how much like this like target training type things when you're talking about moving the glove farther or further back like i feel like there's so many similarities with birds and monitors definitely yeah i think that, i mean i th I've, I've kept mainly tegus and a few monitors but i think that that reptilian brain is very similar in that regard where like you know, you can you you can train. I think monitors probably could train in a similar way to falconry. Yeah, um, but I think it's dangerous to over anthropomorphize. You know, hawks and monitors, same thing. They're both, you know, predators, and so I think it's good. The most effective falconers, I think, tend to not over anthropomorphize their birds. Yeah. Um, Carl's asked if you have names for your birds. I do. Um, because I'm a giant, I'm a giant man nerd. This is Fox, like from Harry Potter. And then um, my other bird is Ezra. Ezra, what's the meaning behind Ezra? So there's not a huge meaning behind Ezra. So here's another bit of weird falconry tradition is when you get your first bird, not everyone does this, but a lot of people do. You start the name with A, you know, a name starts with A, B, C, D. You know, and so Ezra was my fifth bird, and then Fox is my sixth bird. Oh, shit. <laughs> I like it. Obviously, you can't do that in snakes. Cause we'll do that with uh, – yeah, easy. I guess if you wanted to translate that, what you could do is say 2018 offspring have all A names, 19 offspring B names, and then you can categorize that way. Like what we do with themes – if we were smarter, we could have just done some it people, with the alphabet. I think some people do it that way. I yeah. Think it's really cool. I think that's just an interesting way to keep track of yeah. where you're at. Absolutely. Yeah, because people are like, how many birds have you had? I'm like, uh, I've, I've only had six, and I was still like, uh, I don't know. But now you know, I can look back at it, and I know exactly. I like traditions like that. I don't know. It makes it feel like more community and, like, I don't know. Speaking of traditions, does every falconer have to wear flannel? <laughs> Is that a thing? I didn't even notice that. <laughs> it seems like a thing. Python page. We just all think we're these awesome outdoorsy lumberjack types, you know, and that's probably why. Because <laughs> that was the when I was reading H for Hawk, they talked about the flannel thing. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know. Apparently, it's a thing. It goes good with the, the leather, I guess. Yeah. So, wow, that sounds weird when you put it like that, but <laughs> but it makes yeah. sense. And he's a farmer. That's and true. And flannel and farmers, I feel like, is a thing. <laughs> or just hunting, especially like if you look at like waterfowl hunting or something like that's the the garb seems awfully similar in a sense. Yeah, maybe that's why it's like we're it's like that hunting garb. Or like drab colors. Yeah. Like I see them either in khaki or flannel. <laughs> But um, what other? We're running low on Talk time. So this H, the... What is this H is for Hawk book? Huh? We were talking about it before. What is this book? Oh, yeah. I guess we can talk about how, like, what are some good reading materials that people wanted to go get into just learning about it? 
Um, I mean, as far as like narrative novels or or like actual like kind of nonfiction reading material and stuff. A little bit like yeah, like brass tacks, like the actual information that you need to know to to get the job done. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely recommend starting with, um, and and this isn't specific to California because most people use this as their study material too. But there's nothing. There's like a combo. I think the website is if you go to California Hawking Club. They have like the the steps to get started in Valkyrie too, and they will list all the things, including the, the reading material. And one of those things is a two pack of books, and it's um, the study guide for the Valkyrie test and the apprentice's book, um, handbook. And both of those are really awesome places to start. They don't read necessarily like you know a dictionary, but they are really informative, and they've done a good job kind of concentrating down like a ton of helpful beginner information. Um, and, and, and it's not like wasting your time either because once you've read it, you'll be ready to take your test if you want to proceed from there. And is that apprentice book, is that particular to California or is that covering the gamut of places? So the study guide is, it's called the California study guide, but I think a lot of the country uses it to study too because it's one of the more comprehensive ones. Um, and not every state has one, you know, I think like New York has one, California has one, and a few others, but... California is definitely very comprehensive. And then the actual apprentice book that itself is totally, it's just how to train a red tail, you know, how to trap and train a red tail. And so it's not region specific at all. So, but, but they're pretty much putting in your mind already, you're going to get a red tail, your first bird. Yeah, that's pretty much. Yeah. I mean, they'll cover like, Oh, also it would be different if you did it with a Kestrel in this way, you know, but for the most part, they start with a red tail too. And, I mean, I know very few falconers who would say, yeah, you should definitely start with the Kestrel. It's not, it's not, because they don't have that as um, a beginning bird because it's a beginner bird. They have it as a beginning bird because it's really abundant. And so mm. if for some reason it escapes, you know, one, you're not harming its population by trapping it. And two, if it escapes, you're not introducing um, some sort of non-native bird or, or, you know, exotic bird to the wildlife or to your like local ecosystem. So, so most falconers will recommend you start with a red tail, and then if you're successful, the next year you can try to fly a kestrel. Gotcha. Um, are there also some big like books like famous falconers or something like that? Yeah, I mean, there's a t there's a ton of um, like once you get deeper into it, there's a ton of books on like the logistics of falconry, different training techniques, um, you know, all, all that stuff. But if you're talking like Something that just you want to see if it piques your interest. I think, I think, uh, H's for Hawk is a great place to start reading. You know, it goes over. It's a narrative. It's really kind of a cathartic story, and it um, does accurately portray some of the beginning elements of, of training a, a hawk. And then Ryan in the chat asked. I mean, like, obviously, you said you want an exotic bird but i mean what are your your feelings on flying exotic bird are there things to keep in mind um yeah i mean i think you have to and you have to like recognize the challenge that that species poses um and, and think if like like for example a goshawk is definitely not a beginner bird and it's probably not an intermediate bird either um, and so this season, I'm going to take a Cooper's hawk, which is um, the same genus. They're both occipiters, is the is the genus they're in, um, and fly a Cooper's hawk and see if I'm successful with that. And then if I am, I'll move up to a Goss hawk, which is kind of a more exotic. They're native, but it's definitely a more, you know, exotic bird. I I mean, what would be the repercussions of say, you know? The that bird that you got from, I forgot where exactly it was. Um, Peru. Yeah, Peru. And what if it got away, essentially? I mean, is it adaptable? You'd be in, you'd be in deep trouble, but so you have to fly and I may be wrong on part of this, but I'm like, so you definitely have to fly any non-native birds. It's a legal requirement to fly them with a the transmitter or a GPS. Um, and I think hybrids, this is the part where I'm about 90% sure. I think hybrids, you have to have redundancy, which means you fly them with two different transmitters. That way you really avoid them getting away. 
Um, odds are that they get loose and survive and do damage to the ecosystem is very, very low. But odds are if, if, if an exotic bird gets away, it's probably going to get killed, unfortunately. So you really want to make sure you keep, keep track of it. Right. I, I guess you don't really have the same issues that the snake world has just because we have commercial, you know, we have commercial places that, you know, if someone happens to that commercial facility, you may have thousands of animals out, you know, with a falconer, maybe it's just one. one. <laughs> and the other thing too, is like, because it's such a close community, like if someone sees a bird with equipment on, they'll immediately reach out to the community. Like, Hey, who lost a bird in this area? It's seen here. Um, and they all, all the non-native birds, have bands on them that are that are regulated, so they have a database of whose bird that is. Oh. And so generally, if another falconer sees a bird and they can't get a hold of anyone, they'll trap that bird, um, and then they'll have they'll look up in the database who it belongs to. Do they ban? I mean, just like uh, just like geese and stuff like that, and ducks. Do they yeah. ban red-tailed hawks? I'm not sure exactly why they do that, but. Uh, are there banded birds for other reasons, basically? You know, that's. I may not. I don't. I don't think I know the full answer to that. But generally speaking, I, they may like ban them for like conservation and being able to track migratory patterns and stuff. Um, but it's not something that I've seen commonly. Like I've never seen a trapped bird with a band on them. But because like it's a, it's a big deal if say you're hunting uh, Canadian geese and you shoot a goose that has a band on it. And then you take the band and you give it to the Department of Conservation or whatever in your state, and they each have like an ID number. And I didn't know if they did that for hawks too. So, yeah. Well, I mean, because if you, I mean, I'm sure if you trap and trap a bird and put on it, if that exists, you'd probably have to let it go. I, I mean, that's what I would do. Um, if it was, if it didn't belong to another falconer, I would check first. You know, um, but yeah, like. Because we're not hunting them like geese, you know, like we don't have, we don't really have a system in place to report, to report that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So if people are interested in whether it is ball pythons for sale, retakes for sale, or to pick your brain about all things. Falconry. Yeah. Where can they get in touch with you? Um, so probably social media would be the best bet. Um, I have a, a, an Instagram account. That's send Cal Exotics as well as a Facebook. Um, or if they would like, they can add me on Facebook as well. Um, my name is Tony Pantaleo. And look at the description, hopefully, because it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll also I'll put all your links in the description. And send Cal is like C E N, like Central California. Yep. So. Wow, I just got that. You thought it was. <laughs> Yeah, didn't you? No, I knew it. It says Sincal. I just didn't know why it was saying. I didn't know what the city. I'm assuming. I, yep. yep, you got I it. Know, I knew it was C E N because it's spelled in front of me, but I did not know it was. Where are you in Central. California, by the way? So I'm like smack dab in the center of California. I live up in the mountains, of just outside of Yosemite, um, and then I farm down, farm and, and make wine and juice down in the valley area. Oh, well, that is awesome. Why? Well, I was more thinking Yosemite, but... Oh. Well, when he first said Yosemite, he was like, oh, cool. But then when he said why, I was like, yeah. <laughs> I like that. What? Damn, now I want to have a whole hour talking about wine. <laughs> so, so you were doing on about Yosemite, and you were doing an on about the wine, right? Yeah. <laughs> also the first that hates... That is, the, that is like the thinking of our life. Like, <laughs> that, that's the... the like the tension no. always is me trying to do the opposite thing. She likes culture. Well, things. wine is the opposite of Yosemite, but no. But I want to like be outside and do things. I want to be outside of the vineyard. Yeah, 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 and drink wine. Yeah, exactly. As long as there's no bugs. As long as there's no bugs. Yeah, it's so good. The dichotomy is my wife and I, so I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah but your wife does possums and squirrels, so that's true. Oh. Yeah, was was she into wildlife before you met her? Uh, probably not to this degree, I would say, but you know, she always liked animals. And like, I think that was one of the things that where most people are like, this dude is a weirdo. You know, she's like, she was, she, even if she wasn't into it, she admired like my passion for animals. You know, she's like, dude, you're dedicated. Like how many hours you're spending, you know, caring for all these animals. And she's always been super supportive, which is, you know, she's like, oh, you bought a new snake. Cool. <laughs> so that's pretty, pretty solid, you know, and she goes out if I need her to help me like 
she's a good sport. Like we're trapping these these raptors with giant talons, and I'm like, all right, throw the towel over it. You know, I'll grab the feet. <laughs> I would I would be tentative to do that. So. <laughs> Like if I'm in the room with a retake, like I always work with them when she's there, so that you know I have backup and like, you know I've never had an issue, but like one of them was out and like crawling around, and she's a big girl, and I you know kind of kind of hollered for her a little bit to come and help me out, and she came in and without skipping a beat, she grabbed the retakes you know lower half and helped me lift her back into her cage. So I don't know a whole lot of gals that would jump into like a 14 foot retake. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's someone who, I mean, at this point, you need someone who's down with all the birds and all the all reptiles. Yeah, and that's the same with, I, I think we're all in that position to where it's like, if we were all to be single, I mean, at some point, you're either with a snake girl or a wildlife person, or you're pretty much screwed because no, there's so much about No, lives. I think it's much easier with snakes. And when you're it just, isn't, it isn't. when you're just a hobbyist snake person, like if I, know, I had like, one hawk in a ten by ten out back, I mean that's no big deal, right? Yeah, if we're going out and hunting with it every day and stuff like that, it's like I don't, know. I don't know. It depends. It depends on the quantity and like how much you're doing with it. So like I think <laughs> there's lots of snake people whose wives or significant others aren't into it at all. Yeah. And I'm sure there is for hawk people too that they don't always have a significant other who's into it. Oh yeah, I, you know, I mean, that's definitely pretty common actually with hawk people. Is even if they were married, it just <laughs> takes so much time and financial resources <laughs> that. <laughs> that was about me too. <laughs> you forgot, huh? <laughs> I got it so good. The one before that, I didn't move at all. I was so proud of myself. Dang it. Oh, okay, sorry. Wow, real scary stuff today, huh? <laughs> I should have brought my other one. He would sit just he would have sat here this whole time on the glove without making a peep. You wouldn't have known. Um yeah, so I think people, it's definitely, you know, pretty it just because it takes so much of your time. You have to have a partner who's pretty, you know, independent. Yeah. Like I fly my birds seven days a week. Wow. That's how impressive. many hours? Um, at least an hour, hour to three hours, probably is my average. Oh. And is that something that you need to do? Does that bird need to get out that and often? His soul, his soul needs. <laughs> the bird, I mean, the bird doesn't need to get out that often because, like, during the molt, you know, it stays. It's I don't fly it a lot during the molt because um, I want its feathers are growing well. But um, I I enjoy it partially, partially because I do it for work, and then partially because I want to do right by the birds, you know. And like, it's like having a dog. Like, <laughs> Not every dog needs to have a two-hour run every day, but, like, if you own a working dog, you should run that dog and do do right by it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess it comes through a lot louder in other things than this, but I'll, I'll have to, like, limit the, the bird noise. Which is, like, the best reason I've ever had to edit a podcast, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like you have a bird there, like... A little like you know, like chirping scream, and he has this awful old man thing. You know, he sounds like he smoked a pack a day since he was twelve. Yeah, it sounds like something dying more so than <laughs> each other. Yeah, <laughs> known for their uh, for the beautiful sounds they make. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like you had the bird there the whole time. Is there anything you want to like show anyone who's on the on the other side as far as video wise about the bird or anything you can explain about it? Um. Can you show me that thing you were talking about? Well, he was talking about it on owls. Oh, I thought he was saying owls don't have it. So the crop, you can't really see the crop unless um, it's full. You know, like you'll see after a meal, it's kind of like a, a bulge right under their throat. Um, and you can, yeah, you can see the meal they're storing there. And they do what's called putting over and they'll put over their crop, which means like they'll store it there and then put it in their stomach as they metabolize. So he was saying owls don't have that. That's mm. why it's hard to hunt with owls because they just eat it all and it goes right down. Wait, so are you able to like store it and do so it. So do you make him piece. regurgit it to, to eat it? No, so he, he, he keeps it in that storage pouch and then slowly he'll put it into his stomach and metabolize it as needed. So like an owl, you really have to feed it like every day, probably sometimes twice a day, depending on the size and the weather. But this bird, like if you really cropped it up and it had a full crop, it could live off that probably for a couple days. But as far as when it hunts, I mean, it brings the prey to you in its talons, right? 
No, so like no one really has been successfully <laughs> able to <sorry. laughs> has been successfully able to like train their birds to bring it back. It's just uncommon. Like, so the birds will grab the prey and go down with it and you do what's called like making in and you'll move in. Um, and yeah. And you move in, like you kind of have to teach them if they're hunting small game, not to carry their game away, you know, cause it could be a problem for you. So like you, you teach them to stay there and await for your arrival and you'll move in um, and then kind of do the trade off from there. But yeah, they don't actually bring it back to you. Oh, stupid birds! <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it uh, like as a fluke a couple times where they'll throw the lure and they'll drag the lure and they'll bring it back that way. I mean, at least I mean, at least you have to work for. I mean, you have to work for it in every which way. Actually, there's zero easy ways to do this. No, you have to be. If you're, I feel like you are as much active in it as the bird is. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they're they're kind of sitting and waiting on the branch for hawks, and you're just. You're in the bush, just trying to scare things out of the bush, you know. So. And then chasing the bird when it goes, and yeah, like you're following. Is it possible around. to coordinate like a dog with the bird? Yes, I mean for me, it's the most fun form of falconry to watch a dog and a bird work in tandem. Yeah, so a lot of people you'll get like um, there's different breeds people do it with, but like generally they'll use like if they're you hunting ducks, they'll use like a flushing breed, which means the the they'll get the falcon up to the height and they'll release the flushing dog and they'll go flush the ducks or, or whatever the game is. Um, and then for things like quail or even rabbits, you know, they'll use like a pointing breed. So that way they know where the game is and you can make in with the hawk and make sure the hawk's in a good position before you flush the game. Sweet. So sorry, we, we did a bad job on ending it. Because that just came up with like five different questions. I know, we, we were ending it and then we just kept going. <laughs> I realized that my idea of this whole thing was wrong at the very end of it. And I need to learn how they actually Literally, Yeah, it. we went through two hours and then you, yeah, had the whole, yeah, cool. Cool. Job. Good job. I think it was um, totally multifaceted, you know, there's like a million, you know what I mean? There's so many things we could go over and it's like, I'm not, I'm the, not the master of all of those things, but it just brings up more questions. It seems like same thing when I was learning, I was like, each question led to five more. Yeah, and it's like almost you forget, especially in reptiles after you've been doing it for a while, like, because we get asked, you know, beginner questions all the time. But if I was getting into falconry, I would be that fucking idiot. I'm that idiot right now. So it's like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be so hard on those people because they just don't know yet. I mean, it's, it's not common sense. Right. Yeah, um, it's, after a while it feels like it, but it's really not, you know. Right. Yeah, like it seems like it to you just because you're so. Because we know it and it's our norm, but it's not everyone's norm. <laughs> Definitely not. Random question: What? Uh, how old is Fox? So Fox is about eight years old, um, and then Ezra is only about six or seven months old. Oh, big difference. Yeah, so Ezra's uh, Ezra's a youngster. But it's still just as effective. In uh, is that your abatement bird, Ezra? So far. No, so um, Fox is my abatement bird. Um, that's the goal is to have him on the, the abatement permit and then have Ezra on my permit to hunt with. So, yeah. Yeah, he is very, as the, another vernacular for you, he is very gamey, which means he's really inclined to, you know, he has that drive to chase and hunt game um, very much. So he's, I've kind of moved him in that direction, so. So you basically adjusted when you said this bird's going to be better off for this purpose. Yeah. I'm going to just start training him for, for hunting. Yeah. So actually here's kind of a not funny story, but so I actually got Fox, um, like probably this, I got him this year because I had Ezra and he was my abatement bird. And, uh, he, like I said, he's so gamey and he particularly loves pigeons and, so much to my chagrin, he loved, in the urban environments, he loved to chase these pigeons, and he'd catch them on urban roofs. And the, like I said, they don't retrieve. So now I had, in my little Subaru, I had a 20-foot extension ladder, and I'd have to climb up on the roof and, and retrieve him, and he'd have a big old crop full of pigeons. And so I got Fox, you know, and I moved him and put him on my abatement permit for work. And then I'd say, well, if you want to hunt, I guess we're going to let you hunt. And with the crop, I mean, is that 
Um, how do you take the prey away from them before they put it in there? Before they <laughs> eat it? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say eat it, because obviously... Well, they're still eating it. They're not, like, fully digesting, but they're still eating it when they yeah. put it on their crop. Obviously, if their crop is full, that means they're not going to eat more, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's what, And that's why it was kind of a pain, is, like, he wouldn't be able to fly for probably two days because he filled his crop up. So the, the big thing is just to get there as quick as you can, you know, um, to one, to make sure they're protected. And two, if you don't want them to crop up on like whatever they catch to get in there and do that trade as quick as you can and trade them off on the lure. There so, you go. Once again, easy. It's just not easy. None of this is easy. <laughs> no, like I feel like everyone who's into this has to be like 21 and plus, like, or, or not even. This should be so, an like, Olympic sport of sorts. <laughs> That would be interesting. Um, but yeah, like this isn't for anyone like young, I feel like. And you have to be physically active also. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like when I'm hunting, I'll walk anywhere from five to 10 miles probably each time I go hunting. Oh. So I feel like for someone to say, you know, like, oh, you're just out there killing animals for fun. Like, no, dude. So I'm, much more I'm walking that. five miles. I'm raising a bird. I'm. You know, like all this other, I'm weighing it twice a day. I'm, I'm tracking its movement for hour. I and GPS and stuff. So, oh yeah, it's a lot involved. And that's the thing is, it's not about, um, it's not about killing per se. Like, the end goal is for them to to be able to do what they do naturally and and to provide enough food to feed themselves for the year. Um, but the really the the whole enjoyment of falconry is being part of one of the most like natural things in the most intimate way you know like you are able to participate and see the circle of life up close you know and that's that's really the draw to it Makes sense. it's kind of like it's almost in a way kind of like field herping is being able to go out and see animals in their in their natural habitat doing their thing yeah and it's like keeping for us you know we have in reptiles so many captive born and bred individuals that like and they come out of a deli cup and you put them into a tub Hello, and <laughs> it's so far from from a wild animal in a sense. Even though I mean it is, but you don't get that feel that this is a wild animal in any sense. Yeah, you know, a retic feels like a wild animal. Even if it's Captain Warren bread, I feel like it's a wild animal sometimes. <laughs> I mean, honestly, in some of them, like my some of my like Dram Marcon too, they kept you on your toes, you know, but. It's definitely it's very different than going out and being able to like see a white speck nestled into the rocks, you know, or an eastern diamondback or something like that in a in a timber pile. Yeah, yeah, which is like I don't know that that to me is as exciting as seeing something or keeping something in captivity. Um, just being able to see an animal do do what it does. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, for real, last question. For real? Okay, I feel like with snakes, if you're like really into one, even though you're really into one, like all snakes like get you get you going a little bit. But with birds, like I feel like falconry, yeah, do you and, like, like your your hawks are like they're just seem like so different than other birds. Like, do other birds still like get you going or not? <laughs> so I mean, like personally, or like as falconers in general? No, you're you're a personal being. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, for me personally, like. I'm not like a – yeah, they do. You know I mean? It's just <laughs> – <laughs> yeah, I mean, animals in general, especially, particularly – it's kind of a weird dichotomy, particularly raptors and, um, and like, game species that I would take. You know, like, I love going out and, like, observing – in the off-season, observing quail in their natural habitat because that's my favorite bird to hunt. You know, and they're beautiful birds or pheasants or, or whatever it may be. Um, but like we went to Costa Rica you know, last year and it was like I just want to see birds and I want to see reptiles, you know, and so you know it's you you definitely are, are a birder or I am at least. Yeah, I think it's interesting that like even hunters, big game hunters are you know, some of them are just as obsessed about the animal, despite the yeah, fact that they're really hunted. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they're still interested in the natural behaviors of it and everything like that. It's definitely a misconception with hunters, you know, it's like it's not about like we probably know more about our prey than like most people do because we care, you know. 
yeah, you kind of, in order to be good at it, you have to do it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm just as happy going out in in the spring and, and running the dogs and finding quail and seeing where they're hanging out, you know, and watching them as their nests develop just because I, you know, I'm obviously a wildlife nut. How many, how many dogs do you have? Uh, I have, we have a, a regular, we're a critical mass. I told, we're no more animals, but, um, so we have two, two dogs with, with, and we're getting one more puppy done. Um, three cats, um, the snake collection, the, the two hawks, and then we have homing pigeons, chickens, ducks, and that's it. How many, uh, acres do you live on? Uh, two acres. That's a lot of animals. <laughs> yeah, I'm working with animals like from probably from 6 a.m. till about 10 p.m. five day five days a week, and then on the weekends, um, I really get in and clean and weigh and do everything with my snakes and feed them. Are all those dogs trained to hunt? No. So, um, actually, one of my like one of my dog is, I used to run rabbits. And then the dog I'm getting is going to be, it's called like a versatile breed that I could use to specifically to like point birds um, and retrieve game and stuff. So I'm, I'm definitely up in my hunting dog game in the next year or so. Wow. Okay. Master of that. <laughs> Tony <animals>. Zoo. <laughs> that, that's really it is I just, I enjoy training animals. So whether it's dogs or birds or whatever, that's a, you know, that bond is enjoyable. Yeah, I think that that's interesting is that it's the building the relationship as far as obviously you're using the dog for hunting. So that dog has a purpose and you have to train it. And like we had in college, I lived with a hunting dog and we totally ruined it because, you know, we just played with it all the time. And that motherfucker didn't want to retrieve anything <laughs> anymore. It will like get a tennis ball, maybe. And yeah. then like it used to be like just a straight up duck hunting dog and it was really good. And then we, we, just treated it like a house dog and it surely That's stopped doing thing. what it was supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's so definitely it's, it's, a, home. it's a commitment, you know, on, on every angle, which is impressive. For sure. And that's kind of why I want to do it before I get kids, you know, because like, how do you tell the kid, like, you can't play fetch with the dog till they're nine months old? You know, you want to get that kind of dialed in beforehand. Yeah. The kid is naturally going to want to treat it like a pet dog, not a hunting dog. <laughs> Exactly. Plus, when am I going to take care of a kid? I have a whole zoo. Yeah, like Katie do something else. In there. What was that? I was saying, can you actually throw something else in there, like a human? Yeah. Okay. okay. For real? For real ending it this time. Wow. So, Tony, give us a little, I guess we could say it again now that it's like 20 minutes later. <laughs> Wow. You already told us how to get in contact with him. We can't say what again. Say it again, just because we like doing outros. What? Well, <laughs> is it, no, this is a better last question. Is there oh, anything okay. final you would like to say to the world? I mean, just falconry. Like, I know it, it might have piqued your interest, but if you really are interested, go for it. It'll change your life. Um, but kind of, you know, when you're in the place and time to do it and do it justice, I would say it's one of the most incredible experiences to be able to be part of um, seeing a wild animal up close and personal. So pretty much it. Right on. And for <laughs> us, uh, PortsmouthPythons.com, obviously check out. Why <laughs> are you looking at me like that? Send Callie's axe. I'm still talking to the mic even if it's not on. Yeah. <laughs> I've been doing that the whole time. Yeah. It's called Habit. You should, Do you should get on top of it. <laughs> but, uh, All pointless. Wow. Okay. Uh, we will see you next week. <laughs> Is that how we ended? I, mean, I don't know. I feel like you only did half of our outro. Yeah, I know. What do I usually say? I don't know. Watch Facebook, our video. Instagram, <laughs> Four City Pythons, everywhere. Uh, that's pretty much it. Patreon, thank you guys so much for supporting us. Now we get to host the podcast, basically. If the, the podcast is no longer costing us money, guys. It's a really big day. It's exciting. It is exciting. We did it. Did it, guys. Uh, you Thank you guys so it. much we for your support. Yeah, really. Thank you. We just show up and talk. And talk. And drink. And dream about wine. Okay. Bye for real.
Bye for real, guys. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will catch you guys next week.